Jackson Snyder presents... Oh, boy, what a difference. Yes, when a product gets close that were dirty as this. Is that you? Uh, Brother Schneider, why are you calling this time of night? I, I was asleep. Because I have a dream for you. What? Where am I? Does anybody know where I am? What is this place? A dream? A lucid dream? I, I, I can't see anything. Oh, no. Bunch of trees. Lots of noise and everything. What was that? Oh, my God. Tune in again tomorrow. This is Harry Kramer inviting you to join us each weekday afternoon for... It's the Vero Asenia High. Boot camping in laid back Douglas, Georgia. Will the real Jesus please stand up? And here's Onia Carlson, part one. Originally, I was going to do something like Jackson told me to try to prepare five or six teachings for this uh, event this week, and I I planned out about five or six of them and I had different topics I wanted to do and but the first two days just got we got really behind and then it just took the teachings took longer and and so basically I'm st today what I'm going to do is continue the messianic stuff in uh, quoting messianic prophecies but before I do that I'm going to try to cover the other five teachings in a super short version. Just basically what I was going to do for those teachings was I was going to go through many quotations. And I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to basically present the basic concepts. So it'll be pretty quick to go through the other teachings, the concepts. Uh, so uh, one, the I was going to be teaching on Yeshua being uh, a Qumran Asim. Uh, yes. It was yes. my belief that, uh, I, well, I, I believe uh, that, like, years ago, I was seeking the truth for ex trying to find extra books, and it led me to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I became convinced that the, you know, the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, I became convinced that, at least before Yeshua came, the Essene faith was the way. Did it break? Nope. Okay. Uh, it was the way. The Essene faith was the way. Now, like like you have Protestantism or any group, there's going to be differences. So some of the Essenes may have gone off the mark on some things or been too extreme on certain things. Or perhaps even some of the Dead Sea Scrolls might say certain things that go a little bit over the top. For example, some... Some things about the Sabbath and the Dead Sea Scrolls are very difficult for a lot of people to accept because it seems to contradict some things that Yeshua taught. But I wouldn't say that, okay, Yeshua contradicted a couple things in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that means 
he wasn't in a scene. I find Yoshua is super close to these scenes of the scrolls and that any potential disagreements are few and that's the exception rather than the rule and that if you're gonna take him and compare him to Yeshua, compare him to the Pharisees or the Sadducees, there'll be so many major differences. And there, there will be similarities with these groups because they overlap. They have a lot of similar ideas in many ways, but I think the evidence for me is very compelling and overwhelming that he identified with that same group of the scrolls. And um, there are so many similarities of, like when you go through Josephus' writings and Philo's writings, when they when they explain uh, what the Essenes were like, what they believed, and some of their teachings. So many of their teachings line up with things in the New Testament or in New Testament apocryphal literature striking agreements and so some of these agreements are for example I, I wrote down like a list of 15 different things which I was going to do quotations for but as I said I'm not going to do the quotations but I'm going to just point out what those like basic 15 things are that I have identified as as uh, similarities so let me go right to it. Okay, so what I've identified in these documents, the New Testament, New Testament, extra New Testament apocryphal books claiming to be written by the apostles or their followers, immediate followers. I and the Dead Sea Scroll community that Josephus and Philo is a second witness to those scenes. This is the similarities I've identified. Communism and a bishop system, a overseer system. So You'll see in the Essene writings, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus and Philo, they explain that they basically shared everything with one another. Uh, what, what was theirs was the others. And the basic concept here was not that there was no possessions, because we see all throughout the scriptures, like in the Torah, the Torah talks about your own money, it talks about your own possessions, you know, you, you own things in the Torah. So, the I believe the Dead Sea Scroll writers were very faithful to Torah, so their, their communism concept was not contrary to, to the Torah, rather it was a co-ownership. So the idea would be like, if I own something, I own it 50% and the entire community owns the other 50%. So it's a co-ownership. Uh, but no, it's not everyone has equal percentage to it. It's I have 50% and then the entire community has 50%. And so uh, when I want to do certain things or I, when I want to use certain things, it has to be for uh, the benefit of the community. So for example, if uh, I own a house, like let's say I, I, I have a mansion, but it's only me living in there and uh, you have a family who needs like a family of 12 children it would be more fitting for them to be in that house than you so basically you would be compensated uh and you would be told you can't stay there uh, that's that's too much for you these other people need it more than you do here's we're gonna give you another house instead and then they would have like an account system where so it wasn't a complete elimination of the concept of goods and exchanging and buying and selling okay so you will see what I'm saying is my elaboration on how I believe the concept worked. Okay. But the, the communism teaching, you're going to see that in uh, Community Rule and Damas I think Damascus Document. So Community Rule will, will, will speak on the required sharing. But it also implies in that same document that they somehow have a income and that they can use it to buy things. So it's... It's like it's saying, it's like the document is teaching communism and yet separation of goods somehow at the same time. And so that's how I make sense of it. And Josephus and Philo are another witness, which it seems, they're, they're, their, their testimony seems to correspond with what I'm saying. Um, you can you can find in Josephus' writings of uh, the Antiquities and the War of the Jews, he writes about the Essenes in, in that document uh, of Josephus. So, and we know the bishop system of the New Testament, uh, it mentions that and uh, in the New Testament writings and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it mentions uh, the overseer who, and the overseer, according to Josephus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, had authority over all the, all the goods of the community. So uh, he was appointed over, uh, there was a leadership to make sure that the, the system was not abused and that uh, it all worked within the Torah. Um, you, and I was going to quote from 
the book of Acts, because the book of Acts gives an example of communism. Uh, a lot of people say that that was just a voluntary thing, that they were doing that voluntarily. But I believe they were actually following the Essene way and that they believed it was an obligation for them. That, and that Yeshua was teaching them to do that, what they did in the book of Acts. The epistle of Barnabas, you'll see there, it says something to the effect of, if we will be partakers or sharers of things, heavenly things, how much more the things of this world. And that we, we are to be part, it basically says we are to communicate in all things. Epistle of Barnabas. You'll find that near the end, I think. Um, you will also see in the homilies of Clement. In the homilies of Clement, Peter basically says, uh, he says, beyond what is necessary, having possessions is a sin. Be beyond what is necessary. And this fits with what the Messiah said, for example, when he spoke of... Uh, when he when he spoke to the poor man, I'm not the poor man, the rich man, asking what must I do uh, to be saved, and he asked, what 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 do you say? How do you read the law? And he said, uh, I keep the commandments. Uh, like he was, Yeshua was saying, keep the commandments, and he says, I keep the commandments. What else do I lack for salvation? And the gospels differ in how they word it, but one of the gospels says, if you want to be perfect, uh, then go sell all that you have. In the other gospel, it doesn't say all. That you have it just says go sell what you have but one of the gospel says go sell all that you have and follow me then you will be perfect the way i understand it is he wasn't necessarily saying uh to like you know if if, if one of you guys were to sell all that you have uh you just you wouldn't get you wouldn't get it back but the essene concept was you would you would hand over what you had to the community you would either hand over the possessions to the community or you would sell your goods for money and hand over the money to the community and then that community would redistribute it based on your how much you're contributing to the group because those who 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 worked more put in more effort would deserve to have more um uh restitution or um payment for it but they kept it for like year yes the because if they didn't accept me on a year you got all of that family. yes they they had you there was a process three-year process and uh like in the as you said like in the first year or the first 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 two years or something like that you uh you hand over your goods, but you were still being tested, and you, since you weren't a full, full member, you couldn't be in community or fellowship, in full fellowship. And since you couldn't be in full community, it wouldn't be fair for the community to use your things when you can't use their things. So only when they could be joining the full community could their goods be intermingled. Uh, but if they if they were unwilling to fully join or if they did, if they were rejected, then they would get it all back. What were you gonna say? Um, you know, you're talking about other groups there, but I was wondering about that called where if you were saying whether it be you take a scratch or whatever problem. Yeah. Give it up, and I'm sure there were plenty of people. Well, it's possible that it was Peter's wife's house. Like you know how the Essenes sometimes it was like a all male group. That you know there was two groups. There was the marrying Essenes and the the uh, celibate, the male only one. So it's possible that the apostle Peter. Yeah, maybe the wife didn't join at that time, and Peter joined because he actually says in that same passage where the the rich man walks away. Messiah says it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom, um, implying that a rich man, it's almost impossible for someone who has riches to be saved. And then, uh, then Peter said something like, uh, "We have given up, we have given up everything for you. So what, what shall we get? Will we be saved? Because we have given everything up to follow you." Uh, so that implies that Peter and the apostles had forsaken everything to follow him and be his disciples. And it also shows he wasn't necessarily holy. They they had uh you'll see in one of the gospels they had like a money bag where they got money from people. Now there's all there's so many documents like Apostolic Constitutions, Statutes of the Apostles, and there's many others that teach this concept of poverty, of not having lots of for yourself, but sharing with the other believers. So the, the first two things I found in these writings, in the scrolls in common, are the communism and bishop system and anti-riches. There's some really strong anti-riches sentiments in these extra writings. James basically says in his letter, he speaks very harshly towards the rich. Um, and the idea is um, 
No, but you know, you know, Abraham was was we think of Abraham as rich, but the thing was he didn't hoard the riches for himself. He shared with a lot of people because we we often forget that Abraham had to feed over three hundred people's mouths. He probably had to feed maybe more than a thousand people. And how much is required to upkeep a thousand people? You have to be pretty well off to do that. But he's not keeping everything for himself. He's not like hoarding it and keeping it all to himself. All his abundance. He's, he's sharing it with all his servants, all the members of his household. He's taking care of his people, his family. During the time of Yeshua, rich versus humble. Oh, yes. So when they had a dang for the rich, like, talk about rich. Yes. Right, but. We would be considered poor now, but they were rich. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but they had to be ordained to be priests. And I don't think every descendant of Aaron needed to be a priest, but some of them needed to be. At least some of them had to keep doing it. Otherwise, they would be disobeying the law. But because, you know, you know how as generations continue to multiply, you, you eventually get millions and millions of descendants of Aaron. And it would be impractical to have millions of Aaronic priests serving in the temple. So the way that's the similar way I view it is it's a command for the whole race, not for every individual. It's the same commands were given to the animals as well. Uh, uh, be fruitful and multiply it was for animals and humans. So... But there was a, a division of the heads that were not solid. Yes. They didn't get married, but um, and I've read up on that as well. Where it was like marriage, like the women had to prove themselves for three years before yes. being set on. And but they would only have relation for the sole purpose of recreation. Yes. So that's why I mark this as anti-marriage and anti-pleasure with that concept of basically the Essenes believed, according to Josephus, that uh, sexual relations in a marriage is only to be for procreation. You, When you are doing it, you can... It, it's supposed to... It's intended to be pleasing. So it is not a sin. It's not something shameful that you, you have to be ashamed that you're enjoying the experience. But you're not supposed to do it for the sake of that purpose alone. Um, and the same thing with eating. You know, if you're eating... Uh, if you're if you if you're just eating just for the sake of pleasure, that is like gluttony. But if you're eating for nourishment, that is uh, that is a righteous uh, and you can enjoy the food you're eating. But so if we're eating food that's not good for us because we enjoy it for the pleasure, that is uh, I believe contrary to what the Essenes were having us to do. And I know it's a difficult thing to not eat certain foods, but uh, that's the. That's the high standard we're called to, I believe. And uh, you find many documents of the apostles where they basically say, or uh, documents claiming to be written by the apostles, and I believe they were, and these documents say uh, that sex is only to be for procreation. And they say the same basic thing of uh, anti, uh, not doing it solely for pleasure. And... Um, so the anti-marriage thing, you know how it says there's the two different groups? Josephus actually says about the group that didn't marry, he says that they did not con condemn marriage altogether. They just chose not to do it for themselves. Um, because they probably went through a lot of bad experiences with with uh, with women, and they didn't trust women uh, too much, uh, these people. Josephus actually says that. Um, and so I think the... Uh, the marrying is seen were part of, I don't think they were two different sects or two different groups. I think they were from the same people group and that just the one decided to be more extreme, but they didn't condemn others who chose to live the married life. I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay. It, it was only a member of the genus Testudines, but I must announce to you that We'll be right back after the following effectless platitudes. And now, my friends, let me remind you that you can get Vero Essene Yahad programs several times a week over the Internet and live. Yes, these are live broadcasts in which you can chime in with your questions, comments, or criticisms. Here's the schedule. All times are Eastern time. Tuesday evening, 9 p.m. I am there with you. Friday evening, 9 p.m. You are there with me. And on Shabbat, we have a short liturgical Shabbat service at 11 a.m. featuring the Nazarene Essene liturgy, the Shema, and a different speaker every week. That service is usually about 45 minutes. And then on Shabbat, at 3.33 p.m., we have the 3.33 Club. Again, meet up with me there. That's dialogue. All you must do is go on your PC surfing to www.theyahad.com at those times. And we shall be there for you. And if you are on Android, first of all, I pity you. Second of all, you can get us too at those times by logging into Skype. Skype name, Jackson.H.Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, 
and we can dialogue. Otherwise, you want to talk, call me anytime. I do answer the phone, 772-480-8737. That's my phone number. Yeah, my personal number, and I'd love to talk to you. So there you go, 9 on Tuesday and Friday, and on Shabbat, 11 a.m. and 3.33 p.m. That's www.theyahad.com, or Skype in at jackson.h.snyder. Let's hook up in the best way possible. In the name of Yahweh Elohim, see you there! Uh, just like Paul says a lot of similar things of that, where he says, I wish that everyone were like me but it is better to marry than to burn, and all these different things he's saying where um, it is not wrong to be married, but it is superior. And you're also going to see Shepherd of Hermas. I think that's one of, uh, that's one of my favorite documents. Um, uh, wait, hold on. Uh, forget the Shepherd of Hermas thing. I'm, I might be confusing it. But um, anyway, so that's the anti-marriage thing. You also see in the various Acts of the Apostles, Acts of Peter, Acts of Paul, Acts of Andrew, sentiments of seemingly anti-marriage thing but they're not anti-marriage they're just like the Essenes they're saying it's a very dangerous thing to get married and you won't you want to do it only if you're uh, going to be responsible enough to fulfill the, the duties and with the understanding that you're going to have a lot of temptations. So if you're strong enough to do it, then go for it. Um, so then the other thing is anti-animal sacrifice and anti-temple. So there's some documents uh, by the extra books of the apostles and even in the New Testament which seem to be against the set animal sacrifices and against the temple. And uh, Josephus and Philo say that the Essenes were against sacrifices in the temple as well. But the scrolls, I think, help clarify their position. And Josephus actually clarifies that a little too, is that they weren't against animal sacrifices, but they were against the priesthood that currently was in control of Jerusalem. And they didn't think those priests were legitimate priests. So they, since... They didn't accept the high priest as a valid high priest. So, um, they didn't accept the temple, and the, the second temple does right. not agree with the temple scroll of the scrolls. It doesn't agree with the commandments of the, of the law that they have. So they weren't, and it's seeming, they, some documents might seem to, to indicate that they were anti-sacrifice, but I don't think they were anti-sacrifice, I think they were anti that corrupt priesthood system. Yes, what were you going to ask a question? Yes, I will. So basically, what it sounds like when it comes to the sacrificial system, they were for the sacrifice of the Torah, but not for that system that is, to, I guess to the Essenes, they considered the system that the uh, Pharisees had. Yep. I don't, because they, they were illegitimate in the first place. So the things that they were doing in there were um, idolatry, like strange fire. Idolatry or maybe a different word, I don't know, it's just so major sin, major sin. Uh, they considered it contrary to the Torah, lawlessness. And uh, there's just a lot of documents to support that uh, understanding, I think. But yeah, exactly. So um, how does that do um, their vegetarian diet? So I believe there is a misconception that there, there's a lot of things on the internet about the Essenes. And I think, for example, some church fathers write about the different groups of the Essenes, and some of those groups calling themselves Essenes were uh, vegetarians. But, for example, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls don't say they were eating only uh, vegetable, or, you know, uh, they were vegetarians. It doesn't say that. It also, Josephus doesn't describe them as that, and I don't even think Philo does either. Yeah, they are, I've read it, and I get you. I think it was a later church father, perhaps, but if you can find the the reference yeah. that would be good to see. Yeah, I, I have read it where James the Just vegetarian. Okay, yes, and, James the Just, uh, yes. And then um, also uh, the Union one. I think in Josephus, the only reference to to James the Just, at least in the regular version of Josephus, is like it, it's. There's not a large account for James in Josephus, but I'd have to check it again. But uh, yeah. I have to find it. Yeah. No, I, I think no, I think just this is just um in this very yes, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I, yeah, I, so I think it's my understanding that the association with vegetarianism and it seems is only a half truth where there I'm I believe there were uh scenes who who didn't eat meat, but that 
they, most of them who didn't eat meat, again, it was an example of the whole thing of there's the marriage, the marrying kind and the non-marrying, but they didn't condemn each other. In the same way, I think there was the ones who ate animals and the ones who didn't, but neither condemned the other. At least most of them did not condemn each other, but I think there were some renegade Essenes or something that broke away, and the Ebionites probably were a breakaway group from the Essenes. That's how I would regard the, the Ebionites, uh, as coming out from the Essenes and uh, believing in mandatory vegetarianism. Uh, but I think the apostles disagreed with that idea. But I do agree that James uh, did not eat meat. So is that where you get a lot of the uh, possible, as we're coming back together, is that where you get a lot of the really rapid, uh, almost not uh, vegans uh, that come into the Um Well, you're going to see, you know, militant veganism. You're going to see that, you're going to see militant veganism outside of religious circles oh, yeah. as well. Oh, so it's not yeah. just, uh, you not know, I think I think it's uh, arrogance and a pride thing really? that they think they're better than other people. Yeah, that's what they're um, coming down to. Well, I have to tell you, I was in pit not one, I have a problem picture. Right. I've been a meter, but um, last year I was reading Torah um, about don't eat the, the blood, uh, yes. the flesh and the blood they are in. I immediately felt convicted and I told Dave, I don't think we should be eating uh, meat that is purchased if we don't want to eat it right or properly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we stopped, yeah, we stopped buying for about meat. Right. But then I, I started in the fiction about this general yeah. stuff. I have given up meat, although I you know dairy and, and right. things like that, I will still eat. But I just have this fiction and I have to walk out. Yeah. And I, so it's something that I definitely. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, I don't think. It's just, there are those that do have a, if you ask them, okay, uh, why don't why do you stop? Now you're saying perfect. You say, look, I was going to be personal. But then there are those who talk about the, 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 yes, they don't come in, and they'll still, they'll sit there and they'll tell you, God said, y'all would say that we were not supposed to be me. Y'all would say, and they'll even show you the scripture where y'all would say that. And they'll stop being your friend if you right. don't change exactly. it. some of them. Yeah. That's not exactly what they're saying. You know, so that's just one of the things that they you can probably trace that mm -hmm. relatively back, maybe, to this period yeah. and to the group's people. Well, it's oh. like a nice little like, crowd. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone either. Right. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, exactly. Things have to go by the leading of the spirit. Nothing. The spirit will really start to do that. For exactly. No reason. Exactly. For reasons. Exactly. For scary reasons. For whatever. You know, you need to. Both sides of that spectrum. Yeah. Alright, so I'm gonna continue. Um, the next one is basically purification, holiness, prayer, daily worship, pure meals. The description of uh, their, these rituals that they did, purification, holiness, prayer, daily worship, and pure meals, you find that in some of these extra New Testament Apocrypha documents in the way that you see Josephus describing and that the community rule describes. There's some similarities and we know of the baptism similarity. Um, the Essenes got up before the sunrise to pray, and the apostles actually say the same thing in some of the other writings to do that. Uh, and daily worship. The apostles in some of these other writings say every day you are supposed to get together and worship with each other, and that's what the Essenes did every day. And pure meals. The Essenes had a pure, a holy meal of, of bread, and we see, you know, we see the apostles doing the same thing. Uh, then we have theology of afterlife and predestination. Um, we, we see, you know, like with 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 Paul. Paul speaks of predestination in a very strong terms in certain places. You see that same strong term predestination in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in Josephus' writings. So that's another parallel of, of predestination. You find that in Paul and the scrolls and Josephus strong, uh, strong predestination. Um, but I believe that they also believed in free will free will and complete predestination. And they didn't see a contradiction in that. Sort of like as we were talking earlier, like with the uh, the morning and the evening thing for the first few days, you said, I don't know what it is, but you were saying you don't see a contradiction. In the same way, they didn't fully understand how predestination and free will work together, but they didn't see it as a contradiction. When I was reading, I saw that their predestination really strong. So because they were predestined, they were. So their predestination, I was very strong what they were meant to. Awesome. So they're messing up fully. They're part. Yeah. No, I agree. Because you know, not everybody's going to be. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, then, then, uh, as I said, theology of afterlife, basically, 
Um, well, you know, the Sadducees, they didn't believe there is an afterlife, uh, but the Essenes and the Apostles did, and their conception is just very similar. There's like, you know, punishment after death type thing, um, and the soul continues to live after you die. Like some people believe that the soul dies or, or sleeps, ceases to be conscious. Josephus says the Essenes did not believe that. The Book of Enoch, which was found in the scrolls, teaches a conscious torment in Shoal. The apostles are teaching the same concept too. So that's a similarity. Conversion, excommunication. Uh, the documents of Josephus and the Dead Sea Schools teach a three-year conversion process. I have found several documents of the apostles saying the same three-year conversion process, and I don't find that to be coincidence. I think that's very interesting. That, but what they do say, that which the scrolls do not say, the apostles say, uh, three years for conversion. However, if the people who are converting don't need that time, then they can join in sooner because it is not the time that is the the main thing, but it is the quality. So basically, three years is the default because that's the basic. For most people, it's going to take a long time to really uh, be grounded in the faith. Three years is a good solid amount of time. But if you're the type of person who can go through it much quicker, the leaders would evaluate you and say, oh, you know what, you don't need that much time. Just join us right now. So the, I find that apostle statement of the three years, uh, I can't deny the connection there. That I don't see that as a coincidence. I think they got that from the Essenes, three-year conversion. And excommunication, we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you do this sin, you get a uh, reduction of... Uh, you get banned from the pure meals, so you're banned from fellowship, and you get a reduction, you get a reduction of food. There's a document called Book of Clement in the Ethiopian Bible, and it says the same basic type of thing. It says, like, for each type of sin, get excommunicated from the church the, for congregating in the holy place for a certain number of time, and you have to fast for a certain number of time as penance. And this is actually kind of where the Catholic Church gets this penance idea. And, but this document is much stricter than the Catholic Church. Uh, like, if you, uh, if you eat unclean animal, it actually mentions unclean animals of the law, and it says you're not supposed to eat them, and it's a sin to eat them. You don't see too many New Testament documents mentioning that. So it says, if someone eats a, an animal that's unclean and forbidden by the law, and it, and it lists out the types, it says, I was translating, doing Google translation, so it's in two different places, and it's, uh, it's, the Google translation has it and switched around in, in two different places. So I think it's just Google Translator messing it up. But so it's either it's either three weeks of fasting and two months of excommunication or two weeks of fasting and three months of excommunication. But in either case, it's basically saying if you eat an unclean animal, you gotta fast for like two or three weeks and you can't be you can't participate in our church services for three months. That's a pretty extreme uh, thing. And then for adultery and murder, there's it's a long time, lots of fasting. Yeah, it, it goes through each type of sin in this document of the apostles. And there's a couple other documents which do something similar. But this was the one I found most compelling. It says if you are if you have slept with your wife or if you have an omission of of seed, you can't enter the church until you purify yourself. And it says a menstruating woman cannot enter the the the, the church until she is purified from her uncleanness. And it says if she enters the church and uh, if she enters it and then she begins to menstruate on the spot, then she has to get out. And then it says if she doesn't get out or if they allow her in there, it says something like he will destroy her and her seed or something like that. It's like very Old Testament type of language that you know, you're not used to seeing in New Testament stuff. So to me, it's very striking and sounds very Essene-like in exactly the same way you're seeing in the community rule and Damascus document. So I find that connection very compelling for me personally. Uh, the next one is Apocrypha. All throughout the New Testament and in extra books of the apostles, you see them quoting from the extra books, quoting from Apocrypha. Jude quotes from Enoch and the Apocrypha of Moses. Matthew quotes from an Apocrypha of Jeremiah. And there's just so many extra writings of the apostles which quote the Apocrypha, the extra books outside the canon as we know it. And the Essenes had the same type of openness and acceptance of all these extra Apocrypha books. The Pharisees, they rejected all the Apocrypha books. The Sadducees, they even rejected more books. They only accepted the Law of Moses. So. The apostles are coming from a group of Jews that accepted the Apocrypha, and the only group of Jews that accepted the Apocrypha that we are aware of is the Essenes. 
Uh, so I see that. Then against polygyny, I know some people believe that polygyny is sanctioned by the scriptures, but the Dead Sea Scrolls speaks against it in their Damascus document. And in the Temple Scroll, it actually says specifically that what David did was was contrary to the law. Well, it doesn't mention David, but it gives a greater law for what kings are not allowed to do, and David violated that. But the the uh, Damascus document tries to explain why that is, and it seems like its explanation is coming from a lost book of Apocrypha. Either that, or they're just making it up to justify it. But I think they're getting it from an Apocrypha book, because some of the detail they are giving seems to indicate they might have had something more. And they're saying that the Book of the Law had been lost until Zadok released it to the public or he, he publicized it. And because it had not been public and able to be read by people, David did not know what the law said. He didn't know the requirement for the kings. And Samuel wrote the Book of the Law that the Temple Scroll commands. He wrote it for Saul. But then Samuel, Samuel died before David became king. And so Samuel wasn't able to write the Book of the Law for David. And so David never had that Book of the Law written for him, telling him all the things that the law ha that he has to do as a king. That is in 1 Samuel around chapters 5 to 10, somewhere in there. He, yeah, he, 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 write, he writes it, it says, manner of, Book of the Manner of the Kingdom or something like that. And what it says is clearly pointing us back to Deuteronomy. But, some, but what he's saying the king has to do, you don't see that in Deuteronomy, but you see a lot of those things exactly in the Temple Scroll, which makes me think the Temple Scroll is the original Deuteronomy. That's one of the things. Ezra too. Yeah. Say it again. Ezra did it. Who did? Ezra. Uh, I believe, yeah, he restored it. I believe he right. restored the Book of the Law. Right. Um, yes. And uh, so where that section is that I'm talking about of that Book of the Law for the king, that's like in columns like 57, 59, somewhere in there of the Temple Scroll. Um, so there's also New Testament Apocrypha books which speak against uh, polygamy, uh, having more than one wife. I believe that the concubine system was not considered uh, polygamy, not considered having more than one wife, and I believe that uh, that the Essenes did not go against concubines when it was done in a monogamous manner. So basically, the idea was if a woman was barren and she couldn't have children, a woman could take her place to give the man children for her, for her. That's different than him just taking another wife and just, you know, keep taking as many wives as he wants and having lots of children with them all. Uh, so I do believe, because we see Jacob, we see Jacob, we see Abraham doing these uh, things. I believe that it's it's having more than one wife. That's, that's the thing that uh, our, the law is against and not having a concubine for solely for the purpose of procreation and it's a single woman at a time to have be the replacement you're not sleeping with 10 concubines at a time it's only one woman taking her place uh that's how i understand it uh but so you, you're going to see a lot of extra apostle books saying the same exact anti-polygony stance and the anti-divorce and remarriage stance you'll see that as well uh yeshua uses strong uh anti-divorce and remarriage um, and then niece marriage the pharisees Pharisees believed it was okay for nieces, uh, for a man to marry his niece, because the law that their copies of the law doesn't outlaw it. But the Temple School outlaws it, and the Damascus document outlaws it, and some of the writings of the uh, the apostles specifically say, like they make a point to mention it. They say if you, if a man marries his niece, he cannot be, become a leader of the congregation. Things like that. If a man has two wives, can't be part of the congregation, member, leader of the congregation. Um, so those are some very interesting similarities, and I only have I only have one more. I think there was die rather than break the commandments. Uh, you see, for example, um, Josephus's account of the Essenes was uh, they would rather die than break the law than break the commandments of the law. If you read Fourth Maccabees, you're going to see the Maccabees the Maccabees believe a similar thing, and First and Second Maccabees will also give you that picture. But Fourth Maccabees is like a really strong statement of this, and you'll see in various extra apocryphal texts like the apostles, they all die rather than uh, break the commandments to save their own life. Uh, there's the martyrdom, Mar martyrs. It, it focus on martyrs a lot in these extra writings, uh, and so then we have. There are uh, 
Okay, we see that every word, man should not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of our Father. Uh, so it, to me, it's implying, you know, we need, we live by his commandments. And that tell, Deuteronomy says, light, I said before you, life or death, obedience or disobedience. So some people think that if you're in an emergency or in a difficult situation, you can break almost any commandment of the law to save your life. But you're, it's basically saying that disobedience is your life, like when you're doing that. And I believe the Essenes did not agree with that and that the apostles seem, from these other writings, they seem to not have shared that perspective either. You know, the Messiah said it is better to, to cut off your hand and pluck out your eye than to uh, do, than to lust after a woman uh, or to, to, to do a sin and uh, be co condemned. Uh, so that's a pretty extreme thing. You, It's better to cut off that body part than to do that sin. Um, so that, that's why I see uh, those are the main, uh, the, the, those are 10 different things that I have found striking agreements between the scrolls, the Essene group, and the apostles, which make me convinced that the, the apostolic group was a reformed Essene group and reformed because Yeshua came and he reformed it based on his insights and he might have corrected a few things, but he expanded on what the Essenes were doing and he purified it to exactly what it was supposed to be. Uh, so that was the one, that was I was going to do a teaching on that in greater depth showing you all quotations of stuff so that was the one um, how soon do you guys have to leave <laughs> in a few minutes okay well let me tell you what the other ones that I'm going to be sharing with people uh, are and then you can listen to the recording later the basic thing i was going to say was delving a little bit more into the i was going to discuss the the new covenant concept that we see in the ethiopian bible in the ethiopian new testament because it basically you know how there's a law of moses and then it says a prophet like moses um what does that mean well it's the new testament and the dead sea schools as we went through the other day interpret that prophecy as a a prophet like moses is the messiah and the messiah would be like moses but how would he be like moses why isn't every other prophet like moses because it's not just saying he would be a prophet it's saying he would be a lawgiver so what is the law that he was given? You have the writings of Moses. That's the law of Moses. Well, in the Ethiopian Bible, they have a law of Messiah written down in various books. And a lot of these writings, it repeats a lot of the commandments of the law of Moses. But it also, it's it's like, it's the law of a new covenant and there's differences. And it, it explains a lot of things that are left unclear in the New Testament. You'll see the law of Christ or the law of Messiah referenced by Paul all throughout, but you don't know what he's talking about. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my No, that's not all there is. Join us tomorrow night for more Jackson Snyder. Presents. Presents. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Will the real Jesus please stand up? And here's Onya Carlson, part two. And in one of Paul's letters, he talks about like, it says a widow is not allowed to enter the order of widows unless she is uh, at least 60 years old. But where is he getting this idea? Well, the, the law of the apostles or the law of the Messiah in these books mentions that commandment. And, it, and lots of what Paul is saying is said by the apostles, but it's clarified and explained in greater detail. And so a lot of people say that Paul opposed the apostles, but if the apostles wrote these other writings, then he didn't oppose them. And that people are basing their anti-Paul position on very limited evidence, an incomplete picture. Um, so that I find a very powerful thing. Uh, that a lot of the things of the Catholic Church, or what we would call Christian, you know, like we might assume they came from paganism, but the evidence of these documents is that a large number of these things didn't actually come from paganism. They came from the, the Messiah's instructions and that they were perverted later on. They were done incorrectly in a similar way that you have the, the law of Moses and then you have the oral law of Pharisees. The oral law is their way of trying to interpret the law of Moses and fit it to what they how they want to do it. In the same way, you got the writings of the Messiah or the writings of the apostles writing down the Messiah's law. The Catholic Church interprets it how they want to and they're twisting some of the things and just like we lost the original law and like the temple school we lost that in the same way the catholic church lost these writings they no longer accepted them anymore but they were originally they originally got a lot of their ideas from these documents but because they didn't have the documents anymore their oral law their tradition they started corrupting these things so i think a lot of people are rushing like when we left christianity or the mainstream christianity we were sickened, a lot of us were sickened by how far off we were. And we didn't really want too much to do with them. So we were trying to distance ourselves as much as possible from them. And then we were very eager to condemn what they were doing. And, and a lot of people would say they're doing pagan things, but it seems like they would almost want it to be pagan and they're assuming it's pagan. They're looking for, they're like very eager for it to be pagan. Uh, and in a similar way, you see how people who are anti-Paul, they're looking for passages all over the place. They're trying to make him look as horrible as possible. And they actually sometimes really twist what he's saying. If you read it with an open mind, you'll see that even if you don't agree with everything Paul says, these people are clearly twisting some of what he's saying because of how much hatred they have for him and how much how much they want to hate him and be and, yeah, they want to blame him for it. So I see a similar thing going on with the things that the church are doing. Um, and these documents, to me, explain so much. Uh, so that's uh, significant for me. Uh, and I'll try to be quick for the next two ones, is the nature of uh, Messiah. There's different positions that the ancients had. Uh, Trinitarianism, um, that's still going on today. Adoptionism, Arianism, and there was modalism, and Docetism. Have you guys heard of those terms? Okay, so those terms uh, describe seemingly completely contrary position. And they are in their, in their literal specified how they're, they're wording it. They don't mesh. But I have seen different documents of extra books either they're, they're not all valid books some of them are forgeries which is a possibility or some of these books have interpolations people adding things that weren't originally there or all these documents which appear to be teaching completely different viewpoints are all true somehow and that that all these different views are close to the truth but where they err is they uh go a little bit too far in that viewpoint. So I believe in a form of Trinitarianism that differs from mainstream Trinitarianism. I believe in a form of adoptionism that differs from the main adoption viewpoint. And same thing with Arianism, modalism, and Docetism. All those viewpoints, I see them being in many ways almost what I believe. But I can't subscribe to them because they of certain things they say. So um, I wanted to do a teaching that like went in great detail on that. Uh, but but I might read a couple quotations later for that just to give people like I might read a quotation from Docetism apparently and Trinitarianism apparently and uh, there was one other passage I was going to read just to kind of show these documents three different documents they're saying seemingly completely contrary things but maybe they're saying the same thing somehow that's my premise and the final one is what, what I had labeled the gospel of Onia and basically what I, it's how, what what I believe is required for salvation or what the gospel message teaches is required for salvation. And I think you can make a very strong case using the New Testament 
writings and Dead Sea Scrolls that we have to we have to stop sinning to be saved. We have to be perfect to be saved. The original sin doctrine I don't think is valid. The sin nature doctrine I don't think is what the scriptures teach. That we can be sinless and that we are expected to be sinless. First John chapter 3, read that New King James Version. Very powerful. Shepherd of Hermas, uh, commandment number 4. You read that, it's pretty compelling. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, like something like 20, 20 something to 30 something. Uh, it basically says, if you willfully sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but only fearful judgment and expectation and condemnation. So the, the sacrifice for sins is uh, is the Messiah's atonement. And um, it's saying of how, it says in Hebrews, of how much worse punishment do you suppose those who trample the Messiah's atonement by willfully sinning? You know, if, if you reject the law, by rebelling against the law, you receive death. How much worse if you are desecrating uh, the Messiah's grace? And you desecrate the Messiah's grace by um, by daring to sin after receiving grace. So I believe the vast majority of people who think they have received grace and salvation have not. I currently don't believe I have ever been saved or that I'm ever guaranteed for salvation for the last, since 2010, I have not believed that, like, so if I were to die any time in the last, since 2010 to now, I probably would have been condemned in my belief, unless I believe that I've recently come to conclusion that the Messiah has the right to give certain individuals a second chance by resurrecting them in the Millennial Kingdom. And during the Millennial Kingdom, they need to be sinless. Uh, so, uh, but you can't live life with believing that you're guaranteed to be in the Millennial Kingdom. You don't want to, you don't want to be so prideful to think, of course I have salvation, of course I'm saved, because everyone thinks they're saved. Everyone assumes they're saved. I think that's dangerous. So unless you can, you know, for without a shadow of a doubt, and your, your works testify to it. How do you know who will be saved? The fruit, and the fruit is your works. So if you see imperfect fruit, you know you're not yet saved. Um, so you want to approach it with fear and trembling. First John chapter 3 says, if you sin, you are not a child of God, you are a child of the devil. So that's some strong words, but the Messiah said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Uh, so he's using similar language there. It's strong language, but it's to instill fear into you to to turn away from your sin and to repent. Repent actually means to change your mind. If you're still sinning, you haven't changed your mind about it. You're still doing it. So I think the way is much narrower than a lot of people teach, uh, but we can do it. We just need to keep keep seeking truth. And uh, yeah, that, that's basically my take on it. And I think that if you, I think, I assume whenever I see someone that they're not saved. I'm not gonna say definitively that they're not saved, but that's my assumption. And I believe, that if you sin after being saved, you can't be saved again. I believe there's only one repentance. Shepherd of Hermas mentioned this, and Hebrews chapter 6 also mentions this. It says if you fall away, it's impossible to renew you to uh, repentance, or to renew you to salvation, because you have desecrated his atonement, Hebrews 6. So if you take Hebrews 6 with Hebrews 10, if you willfully sin, you no longer have atonement, but only fearful condemnation. If you interpret that as you fall away, so if you willfully sin after being saved, you fall away. But if you fall away, you can't be renewed to repentance, Hebrews 6 says, and that's supported by Shepherd of Hermas, Commandment 4. I really recommend reading Shepherd of Hermas, the entire book. It's one of the most amazing books of New Testament era literature that I've ever read. It's, I think it's, it's, it's a key book, foundation book. And the early church, the majority of the early church considered it scripture and inspired. It's even included in early copies of the Bible, like Sinaiticus, Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, yeah, H-E-R-M-A-S. It's about the size of the Gospel of John, and one of the, it has four visions, ten, uh, 12 commandments, the qu commandments are about repentance. The book is pretty much about all repentance and what righteousness is. Um, and then it has 10 parables, or 10 similitudes. And one of the biggest things in this, there's two big things that takes up the majority of the book, and that's, he represents all of us as shoots of a tree. And, and then he also represents the people as part of, you know how it says we, the believers who are part of the elect will become part of a temple. It presents the temple concept 
you know, parable. And so it's a very amazing book. But anyway, so that's the, uh, that's kind of my overview of what I was going to teach in much greater detail in some of these teachings. You guys have to go now. Yeah, probably so. You know what, but it just, it gives me a higher than a book somewhere in the New Testament writings. It says, uh, to, um, ask It's God in the same God. first of John. It's in the, it's in the same passage of first of John, I think. Uh, I'd have to see what it exactly says, but people make the mistake when they're reading passages of scripture that it's applying to everyone sometimes. So when you look, for example, in the passage, like if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. First of all, the context rejects people, how people are interpreting it. But secondly, who's the we? He's right. John's writing to people. So he's writing to someone. He's not, when he says we, he's not necessarily meaning every person who ever exists. And you'll see things like that, like... Isaiah, one of the prophets, uh, mentioned something like, uh, our righteousness is like filthy rags. He's talking about the people of Israel at that time. He's not talking about everybody. Uh, so I would su suggest that the, who that statement was made to is referring to people who have not been saved yet or who have not become born again yet, but who are believers who are on the path of purification. That's, but I, I guess I'd have to see the passage. Yes. You know, it's a working out salvation. You know, in the Christian church, 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 church,
Paul is saying, you know, you, also, you, you have to sin. Or, but there's a lot of things that Paul says, which he says some pretty strong statements of you need to stop sinning. Do you not know that the unrighteous uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Those who do this sin, this, that, that, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And how many times does it take? Like, it's, he includes murderer, for example. If you, mur if you murder one time, you're a murderer. And if you hate your brother in your heart, you're a murderer in your heart. So it is fearful and trembling. Uh, but as I said, I believe that there is a potential grace that he will resurrect some of us based on his own mercy and discernment for the Millennial Kingdom. And when we are during the Millennial Kingdom, it'll be much easier to be sinless because we'll have our King making it clear to us what is sin and what is not sin. Uh, but we can't live life assuming we're going to get that second chance. So we have to live like we could die at any time and that we could be condemned. So that's my take on it. You're not going to hear that too much from other people. But. <laughs> Anyway, sorry for keeping you guys. Yeah. But... Oh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's Where in that? that's, that's in the Gospels. Let me break in right here and give you a little word or two of explanation. We advertise these events in order to get like-minded people together to actually do the deeper exegetical studies of the scriptures and not just the canonical scriptures, but all scriptures from Middle Judaism to come up with some conclusions about some of the mysteries of the faith. Now look, I advertise this event in Douglas, Georgia for anyone inclined to come to learn about the historical Jesus with the intent to offer food and lodging at the least possible price so more could come if they wanted. We had five days, five nights of convocation, all lodging and food. I charged $51 for the entire thing, lodging and four meals a day. Some people inquired about it. They wanted to come. But the question is, for $51 lodging and food, there's got to be a catch. There's got to be a catch. Well, of course there would be a catch if it was that wonderful Hebrew Roots evangelist, say, in Chattanooga, or that great guy out on the West Coast that's so famous. There would be a catch. Or the guy in Texas that it really is a Baptist in a talit, yes, you pay thousands of dollars for an opportunity like this. I stepped out on faith, along with Daniel ben Regesh. We said, though even our own people said this couldn't be done for $51 and youth free, we were going to prove that Yahweh, who is our provider, could make it happen. Listen, my friends, you are not the provider for the Ahad. You are not going to be taken to the cleaners for one of our events. How could I live knowing that I sucked you dry? $2,000 for a Sukkot? You won't pay anything to get into any of my Sukkot because I am in deep trust as well as the other elders of the Ahad and are excited to take up the challenge of finances. Yes, they said it couldn't be done and it did cost thousands of dollars. But though our movement is very small, the people who are engaged in it are extremely faithful to heed the call. And why? Because this isn't play. This isn't personality cult. This is not even orthodox. We are seekers and we're seeking seekers. If you aren't a seeker, please don't come. Please don't take the risk of the catch of $51. It's not for you. You are not a risk taker. Yet we have found the historical Yeshua and we trust him. He was an extreme risk taker, just as his father is an inveterate gambler. He gambles on you to be innovative a maker of new disciples. He gambles on you to step out on faith, on occasion at least. He gambles on you to seek the historical truth of Messiah, his dynasty, his way, and to understand how his way was hijacked by the devil, but is now returning just as all these incredibly original and authoritative texts are popping out of the ground daily.
Does your pastor or rabbi talk about these? Does he dare put up an opportunity for people for literally nothing at all to come together in the search and quest for the historical Jesus? No way. It's like the oil and the wine in Revelation, in the course of the message of the third horseman. Don't touch it. Don't be a part of it. Our ancestors, the Pharisees, destroyed these texts, and we should keep them underground. But let me say with full confidence that our ancestors, Yahshua HaMashiach, Yaakov HaZadik, Shimon Bar Kleopa, threw open the doors to let anyone come in. And the prophet says, receive free milk and honey, whatever you need, no charge. By the grace of Yeshua, when the time of tabernacles comes, October 5th through 12th, we will say the same thing. Understand, none of us gets a paycheck here. This is a mission, a mission of mercy to a lost and dying world that our Father promised in the sacred vow, in the book of Enoch, to heal and reconstitute in the days of the revealing of the children of Elohim. Those singing today, these are the days of Elijah, they should be singing, these are the days of money. Let's open our cottage industry up. Let's open our church up. Let's open our synagogue up. Let's open up a Hebrew roots group. Let's make some money. But the days of Elijah are not so. There should never be a cost for an entry ticket through the gate to the third temple, which is us. There should never be a sacrificial sheep to be approved by some pharisaical body by the dolloping of red paint. In our day, can you get something for nothing? I submit to you, you can get everything for nothing. But once you receive everything, it will be incumbent upon you to decide what everything is worth. Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, October 5th through 12th, on the Davidic Zedekite calendar of Yahshua HaMashiach. Get ready for an announcement as to where it is. And don't for a minute think about the entrance fee. Come be with the Vero Essene Yahad. Seek out the truth from the ancient documents. Learn what perhaps you've never heard of before. And debunk the power politics of the one world church that is today. Amen and amen. Yeah, unpardonable. And so I consider sinning after you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Welcome back. You're listening to Jackson Snyder Presents, brought to you by the Vero Essene Yaha and Hebrew Nation Radio. I read a passage last time when you were going through Messianic prophecies, so here's what I want to do. I want to go through some more Messianic prophecies, and then at the very end, I'm going to read like three or four passages representing a different take on who the Messiah is. Oh yeah, we're just starting now. Uh, we're just starting now. Um, what? Yes, we're recording. I'm going to go through some more prophecies of the Messiah. Then after the prophecies, I will be doing uh, basically three or four passages of different perspectives of who the Messiah was, his nature, to basically as... You don't necessarily have to agree with what they're saying, but to be aware that these documents actually do exist, and like you know how some people say certain doctrines might not be found in the New Testament, but that is of course with the mindset that this is all that there is for Scripture. So I think at the very least we should know that these other documents exist and read what they say, and then we can test them and see if they're authentic or not. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to read one small passage which... I'm going to share a controversial idea, but I think it's a valid idea. Uh-oh, what a crazy idea for you. Yeah. Where does that lead the rest of you? You'll find it interesting, and it won't be a big... It won't be... 
it doesn't really change anything for us in regards to obedience to the law or anything like that. And it's something that's not a salvation issue. It's not something we really, really need to even need to know. But it's if it's true, it helps us know the way things really are. And I think that can help us better understand things. But so you, well, I'll get to that later. But I read from the that that assumption of Moses extracts last time from the rabbinic writing thing. I'm just going to read one small part of what I had read to you last time because I want to show you a writing of the apostles which seems to have this very document in mind. So it says, um, after the Messiah was talking about the temple that it was going to be built, it says, when, when Moses heard these words from the mouth of the Messiah, he rejoiced greatly, and lifting up his face to God, he said, O Lord of the world, when will this temple built here in heaven come down to earth below? God replied, I have made known the time of the event to no creature, either to the earlier ones or to the later. How then should I tell thee? Moses said, Give me a sign so that out of the happenings in the world I may gather when that time will approach. And God said, I will first scatter Israel as with a shovel over all earth, so that they may be scattered among all nations in the four corners of the earth. And then I shall set my hand again the second time and gather them in that migrated. Uh, so that's the sign that was given to him. But the primary focus of was when Messiah, uh, when Moses was asking the Messiah of about the last days or the cer certain mysteries, and he, uh, God replied, I have made known the time of the event to no creature, either to the earlier ones or to the later. How then should I tell thee? That's the key language matching with this other document I will about to read here. I pulled up all these ones and trying to be in preparation to it ahead of time. Oh wait, um, let me think. Okay, no, I know where it is. I messed up, like, I was misremembering. Basically, I wrote in the page number. I forgot I had written it down. This is Apocalypse of Peter. Now, this particular document, it survives in Arabic manuscripts. The Ethiopian manuscripts are part of the Ethiopian Bible. And the clarifier is, there are certain parts which are absolutely corrupt. I'm certain they're corrupt. Now, the, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian seems has to remove certain passages. So the Ethiopian is pure in that sense that it doesn't have some of the more controversial passages which are probably corrupted in certain places. But at the same time, I believe that it has removed a lot of the authentic passages. Sort of like what I was talking about with Second Enoch. Uh -huh. There's a shorter version of Second Enoch, which is, you could read that and not be too much led astray. There probably might be a fault, couple, some false things in it, but if you read the long version of Second Enoch, there's many more false things in there, but there's also more authentic passages that the short version removed. Um, it's a similar thing with this apoc Apocalypse of Peter. So when you quote something like from this document, uh, I have it as an authority for me and as a scripture, but it's a lower bar than like the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. This, say it again. No, no New Testament, uh, uh, no New Testament, no New Testament writings were found in the scrolls. Now, this is a writing that was just preserved by Christian scribes in the Middle Ages. A lot of documents were, are only known to us by the Middle Age scribes or from early fragments. Uh, and this one was uh, preserved through the Egyptian church, probably. A lot of the Apocrypha books were preserved through the Egyptian church. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, until very recently, was actually, uh, they were actually a part of the Egyptian church and they received their documents from the Egyptians. With the Egyptian, yeah. Uh, the the way it was working is that uh, when a church branches out and like establishes another church it, within their like sort of like under their authority, wherever they appoint it, those people have to submit to the authority of whoever established their church. And so the Ethiopian church kind of got installed by the Egyptian, like the Egyptian bishops were sent over. Um, and <clears throat> then it also has to do with uh, the the Muslims when they started expanding. They were capturing all the different places and they captured Egypt. And uh, I think they also had control over Ethiopia. Possibly, possibly yeah. Um, it's a good theory. And uh, yeah. 
the yeah and the uh basically what happened is uh the egyptians used to write in coptic that was their language it, originally it was the ancient egyptian but it became coptic because they started you know when over time languages become more modernized and they start in- incorporating other languages that's basically what happened with the egyptian they stopped using the hieroglyphics and they started to use the greek alphabet and it became more and more similar to greek in many ways but then when the Arabs took control, they basically made it so that Coptic ceased to exist, um, in, for the most part, in their usage. And they pretty much, the Egyptians started using Arabic entirely for most of their documents from then on. And that's why you see Egypt still to this day is a predominantly Muslim or Arabic-speaking country. Wow. Yes. Enoch, Enoch and Jubilees. Enoch and Jubilee. Yeah. Um, and so those two. That, yeah, it gives it, it deserves to look, be looked at. Uh, so this is page 248. Sorry for taking so long to turn to the page. Yeah, yeah. And some people think that the New Testament is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're just misinformed. There's not nothing of the New Testament. There's In Cave 7, there's like teeny tiny fragments in Greek, which some people really strain at as being fragments in the New Testament. You can make it fit almost. Well, the way it, the way it lasts, Maybe, but the but well, the they didn't find that as good as well. right, yeah, but the, exactly. But the, the thing is, the fragments, I mean, I would be, I would be. like so. I for example, basically, what it, ha- what it, it seems like sense. is that yeah. they're forcing it to fit. Let me trust it. Like if there's a discrepancy in, in the letters that are used, they'll argue for an obscure Greek form that there's not much evidence for that being used uh, in other Greek writings, but just to make it fit or. Uh, and just it's just very weak evidence. Yeah, they want the New Testament writings to be found in the schools, so that's the idea. I used to believe that, but then I was like, actually, it doesn't make sense. So, anyways, uh, so here it says, "O oh, Peter, tell those who believe in me the following: When you see towns tottering, the earth shaking, armies constantly muttering, excuse me, mustering in the world, and fear and trepidation filling the hearts, girdle yourselves, prepare for war, and in readiness, and be in readiness." Know that I will keep alive those who will kill you and drive you away in order that they may receive the torments prepared for them in the last day. Because if I do not keep them, none of them will be able to live on the earth. O Peter, keep the secrets which I have disclosed to you, because their knowledge will be required at the end of the time, and it will only be found with few people. Anyone with whom these words of, of mine are found, harm will befall him. I did not deliver them to any of the pious men of antiquity. The priest Phineas, the great father Jacob, the aged Abraham, the friend, and Isaac, who was offered to me in sacrifice, asked me to disclose to them something of that which I have unveiled to you, but I did not answer their prayers. In the same manner, Moses prayed before me forty days, and asked me to reveal to him something of his secret, but I did not do it. I did, however, disclose to him the place where it will be kept. And Moses disclosed what I had revealed to him from the secret to his disciple Joshua, son of Nun, and Joshua disclosed it to the priest Phinehas. And, O Peter, the priest Phinehas carried the book which contains the secrets which I revealed to him to your great city, where they will be made manifest. It will not be known for a long time, but when faith is made known, it will be made known, and it will be found in the hands of men. That quotation I found interesting because it seems like it was corresponding with the language that was used in the other document. Did you notice the similarity? Mm -hmm. Um, And in another place, which I'm not going to read, but in the same document, in another place it says, they will label, basically they will label the extra books it doesn't use these words, but I'm paraphrasing. It will label the extra books as, uh, they will make lies and slanders about the extra books, and they won't believe them, and all the books will be lost. And that was fulfilled. You know, we pretty much lost everything, but it's been coming back. Anyway, so now I'm going to read something which, uh, I'll do the, I'm going to do the Gospel of John one with Jubilees first. I, I wrote it in a certain order, but I'm going out of order because, like, the first one I had was Enoch. But we're all familiar with Enoch. At least, well, we're more familiar with Enoch, so if I do do Enoch, it'll be later, and it'll be dependent on if we have time or not. But for now, I'm skipping Enoch. Uh, so, the Gospel of John, chapter 7 to 8. Now, remember, there's some really compelling evidence that verses like 53 of chapter 7 to 8, verse 11, that story of the adulterous woman is not part of the original text. I believe it was part of another apocryphal text, and that story was added in, because uh, Papias actually refers to that story as coming from the Gospel of the Hebrews. So I suspect that they like the, some scribes like that story so much, they decided to add it to it in the similar way that I've mentioned how it seems like the scribes look at the Habakkuk 
Apocrypha and added two of those stories about Daniel into the book of Daniel in the Septuagint version because they saw it was, it went well with that book. And I think that's what they did with Gospel of John. Uh, but so I'm going to read not the entire thing of chapter 7 and chapter 8, but just the relevant parts which I believe make a clear parallel. So first 11 verses I will read and then verse 14, followed by verses 37 to 52 of chapter 7. And then I'll read uh, some of chapter 8. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Actually, I don't need to read all the rest. Basically, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? And then it says he, how he told them... Uh, my time has not yet come to go up. Your time is always ready. Uh, he says, you go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. He said these things, he remained in Galilee, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. But not openly, but as it were, in secret. Uh, then it says, verse 14, Now about the middle of, middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having neither studied? And then, you know, he... he the Messiah says some really amazing stuff in this chapter about who he is and claims about himself, but I'm just going to skip all that. And let's see, I have it as 37. Okay, verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, the rest of that, but basically it's telling us when this happened. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle. And then we see in, well, the, the story of the adulterous woman clearly interrupts the flow of the story. Because it then says... Everyone went to their own house, and early in the morning, it's changing. If you remove that story, it's still on the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's the important part. Uh, so, what? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe they saw a parallel account that seemed like, man, eh, maybe it goes here. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. So, again, you should, you, <laughs> you should read the... If, when you have the time, if you want to go through these to compare the similarities, read through all of chapter 7 and chapter 8. Uh, but to save time, I'm only going to read the part which corresponds with Jubilees. It says, well, you know, it starts talking about Abraham. And then it says, like, who's Abraham's descendants? Who are Abraham's seed? Um, they claim to be his descendants or his seed. And he says, you're not. And they say, they say Abraham is our father. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Um, um, maybe it might say that, but that's not what Jubilees. It's not the connection with Jubilees. But so it says. Then the de then the Jews. I was about to say then the demons. But <laughs> then the like Jews that. said to him. <laughs> <laughs> And the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Then he says, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's how they have it here. Some people contest that translation. But, uh, then they took up stones to throw at him, because they considered it what he just said to be blasphemy. Now we go to Book of Jubilees. And here's... Oh wait, that's Enoch. Uh, Jubilees has something pretty compelling similarity using similar language um so let me see. it is in it well, it is in chapter chapter 16 of jubilees and i think i saw someone else say this i don't think this was my original it, i i like saw it myself wow i think i read it online similar if someone had pointed it out on like a yahoo thing or something <laughs> yeah, I saw someone pointed. I know. I'm plagiarizer. What can I say? So you admit it. <laughs> Quick, get the stones. <laughs> so it says, verse 15, after the announcement of they would have a child. And in, by the way, in Jubilees, each of the feasts usually are associated with some type of covenant being made on that time, or a major event, 
surrounding uh, redemption for people. Um, so it says, And we went our way, and we announced to Sarah all that we had told him. And these two rejoiced with an, with an exceeding great joy. Oh, by the way, when it says we, it's the angels speak. And Paul and Stephen in the New Testament say, The law was given to Moses through the mediation of angels. And it doesn't say that anywhere in the Old Testament as we have it. What does it say? Oh, does it in some translation? I am of the understanding that they're actually referring to Jubilees when they're saying the law was given to Moses through angels. Uh, and because Jubilees claims to be the law given, being given to Moses, and it's being spoken by angels. They say we all throughout it. And there's things like in Acts, it refers to Moses as 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. Nowhere does it say that in the Bible. But it says it in Jubilees, although it, it rounds it in Jubilees. I mean, excuse me, it rounds it in, in Acts. It it's specific it's specific age in Jubilees. It's something like 38 and 42 or 42 and 38. In Acts, it's 40 and 40. It's rounding it to 40. Um, that's a compelling su uh, support of either Jubilees or either the Lost Testament of Moses or the original of Exodus had that detail and it was removed. Uh, one of those three or all those three options are possibilities. But so it says... These two rejoiced with an exceeding great joy, and he built there an altar to the Lord who had saved him, and had filled him with joy in the land of his pilgrimage. And he celebrated a festival of great joy in this month, seven days at the altar, which he had built at the fountain of the oath. And he built tents for himself and his servants on this festival, and he was the first one to celebrate the festival of tabernacles on the earth. Then it mentions the sacrifices he did. I'll skip that. And then it says, And he blessed his creator, who had created him in his generation. For according to his pleasure did he create him. For he knew and observed that from him would come the plan of righteousness for the generations of eternity, and that from him should also come the holy seed like him who had made all things. And he blessed his creator, and he was glad. And he called the name of this festival, the festival of the Lord, with a joy acceptable to the Most High God. And then it says a little later, that Israel shall celebrate the festival of the tabernacles seven days in joy, in the seventh month. And then at the very end it says, Abraham took the heart of the palm and good fruit of trees, and every day and day he would go around the altar with the branches seven times a day, and in the morning he praised and thanked his God for all things in joy. So it said, the plan of, he said, for he knew and observed that from him would come the plan of righteousness for the generations of eternity, and that from him should also come the holy seed like him who had made all things. So it sounds like it's saying, Someone who is like the Creator would come, and Yeshua is like the Creator. That's what it seems like it's saying. And then it says, and he blessed his Creator and he was glad. This is during Tabernacles. So I've seen this connection with what Messiah says. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And he's telling them this on, during Tabernacles. Which I find it an interesting coincidence, or not. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think he's subtly implying, like, who he is and the fulfillment of the tabernacles thing right here. That's what I think he's trying to do. I don't know if you think that has validity or not, but I find that a, a good... Uh, Tune in again tomorrow. Brought to you by Pillsbury's Instant Mashed Potatoes, Pillsbury Chocolate Fudge Cake, and Pillsbury Buttermilk Pancakes. Pillsbury, who helps you add a loving touch to every meal. Pillsbury. This is Harry Kramer inviting you to join us each weekday afternoon for...
congratulations, Bogdan, on your big win at the Gifford Talent Show. Oh, well, you heard about that? Sure did. Well, that, that's a miracle because I win that, I get applause, and I get a big shot of self-esteem. Well, as the big winner, I want to shake your hand. Well, wait a minute, brother. Tyler. Oh, 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 Bogo, Bogo, Bogo. Oh, what's the, what's the problem? Brother Nair, don't you see these great big hands all swelled up with arthritis? You squeeze my hand too hard, it hurt terrible. I think I'm going to just lay down and die. Oh no, wait a minute. You don't have any problem at all. What do you mean? Well, sir, I've got a new jar of Tikkan Olam pain relief cream. Oh, that won't do any good, surely. No, really, really. I just rubbed this into my sore hands myself. And the pain went away. And then when I sprained my ankle last week, I did the same thing. I was really surprised. It's the true testimony. Well, okay. If you, if you think it will help, I will try it. All right, I'll go get it. The next day. Well, there's the big winner. Good morning, Bogdan. And good morning to you, Brother Snyder. I'm a big winner every day now that I have Tikkun Olam Pain Cream. Yes, it worked like a charm. That's because it's got prayer power. Made by hand by a believer like us. So then, wh why do I get more of this pain cream? Oh, you can get that and all kinds of other remedies made of the finest ingredients in by hand at TikOlam.com. That's T-I-K-O-L-A-M.com. Let me buy you a jar, Bogdan. Oh, no, 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 Brother Schneider. Let me go first see if Medicare will pay for it. Well, I don't know whether Medicare will pay for it, but if you want some great products that I use, go to Tikolam.com. That's T-I-K-O-L-A-M.com. Yahad member certified. Oh, yes, we have to have that. This is Commander Lee, driving on a lonely road in the uh, backwoods of, uh, of Georgia. We've just had another installment of the continuing path and halakha of the Vero Isi and Yahad. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you take it for what it is and examine it and maybe or not apply it to your life and to your walk praying for a safe trip down to down to Vero Beach the international headquarters of the Vero EC and Yahad we hope you have a great day Shalom to experience Jackson Snyder presents we will examine the life of our master Yeshua by discovering his ancestors family and friends by reviewing rare ancient manuscripts and speaking to those who know him best from the Vero Essene Yahad now experience Jackson Snyder presents This is Harry Kramer, inviting you to join us each weekday afternoon for... It's the Vero Essene Yahad, boot camping in laid-back Douglas, Georgia. Will the real Jesus please stand up? And here's Onya Carlson, part three. Odes of Solomon. Uh, I'm not going to read any of those in Psalms of Solomon, but I recommend going through those. I wanted to quote from some of them, but I was like, uh, it was too much to go through, and I was like, oh man, I had to quote through almost every, almost every chapter has some stuff about this. I just decided to leave it off. There is a mention of virgin birth in the Odes of Solomon. Perhaps it's not authentic. Added later, there's also things like mentions of the cross and things like that. So there might be some Christian. It was preserved by Christians in Syriac, the Odes of Solomon. Uh, so. <coughs> The, the odes are different than the Psalms of Solomon, but they were in some manuscripts included both together. There's only a few manuscripts of these things. But uh, 
I think they're worth looking into because, first of all, First Kings says that Solomon did a thousand and five songs. And we only have the one that we're familiar with in the Bible. There has to be more songs that he wrote because it says, and we would assume that it's not just making up the number. But where did they all go? Yes. And well, Solomon was full of wisdom, and part of wisdom would be learning all different things and sciences, and he would probably have learned music from his father. As well. <laughs> um, the Dead Sea Scrolls says David did 3,600 songs and 450 songs, and we're missing the majority of those as well. Um, but surely David would have done more than Solomon. So if Solomon had done 1,005, David would have at least done that and more, because he, he was the musician. Um, but so where do they all go? <coughs> well, I think, similar to how the Book of Psalms is just a small compilation preserved of the large, massive psalms that have now, of David that have now been lost, in a similar way, I think they must have done with these odes and psalms of Solomon. They Maybe they were done by Christians who they, they saw, oh, these are really messianic. So they, they took them out and put them together as a collection, and the rest they kind of didn't bother with because it would have been too much to translate them. Um, yes. <laughs> I know, I'm, I, I need to get up on my game, you know. <laughs> scribes? <laughs> well, the Messiah rebuked the scribes, so it shows that well, they're accountable and they have a huge responsibility. So I do take that seriously. Uh, I'm well aware of the potential for condemnation if I start trying to do things I shouldn't be doing. You know, yeah. I'm trying to be doing it right. Uh, but yeah, so I'm not going to go through these, but I recommend reading them to see what they have to say. And, you know, with regards to the virgin birth thing, you might be skeptical of it, but just reading it to see what it says. Uh, Syriac Apocalypse of Daniel, I was going to quote from that, but um, I didn't get the chance to download it, so I'm not going to this time. But that one prophesies of the Messiah as well by Daniel. Now, I'm going to... Okay, this is uh, Luke chapter 11, and I'm reading verses... I think it's, well, I have it down here as 14 to 32. We'll see if I need to read all that or not. Okay, so, yeah, I'll probably be reading most of it. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to him, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do, you, do your sons cast out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, and he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted, and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds swept and put in order. There he goes and takes with seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last of that man is worse than the first. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the, and the breasts which nursed you. And he, But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given it to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the sign will be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. What's very interesting here is there's a document called the Testament of Solomon. I don't know if you're all familiar with it or not. Now, it mentions virgin birth in a very suspicious way. Like, it puts it in the mouth of a demon, which I don't believe that the demon would have said that. So I think that it's just you're just trying to contradict me there. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm skeptical of it, so with things like that, even though I would want it to be true, you know, so I could say, there it is, I'm right, you know, but it's just very hard for me to believe that that was actually said. Plus, there's other prophecies which seem to say that the demons didn't know about certain, so I don't think... They would have known about the virgin birth um, if it did happen. But the, the main important thing to note of this is Josephus. 
he uh, he describes something about Solomon, a writing, or I think he mentions it as a writing, or if not a writing, he mentions the account, and it matches the Testament of Solomon very well, where it talks about how Solomon had authority over demon. And what we see in the Testament of Solomon is Solomon is given a ring, and well, Islam actually has the same basic story in their Quran, and some of the apocryphal literature made it its way into the Quran, and uh, so some people, they say, oh, that's Muslim, we're going to reject this idea, but the Quran was you made using a bunch of different sources and putting it together, so uh, I don't think that's reason to reject these kind of books, you know. Um, so basically, Solomon was given this ring, and he that ring gave him a special authority by the power of the Spirit to to summon demons, and basically, uh, I forget how it happens, but basically he he uses demons, like, he, he gets, he first of all, he finds Beelzebub, or Beelzebub, and then he gets all the other demons, the main major demons, under his authority, so that they're, they're like blinded. And he says, "Who? Tell me your name. Who are you? And how are you defeated?" Or whatever. And then yeah, he uses them to build a temple. But so, anyways, the uh, he's using like he's using demons to take down other demons. And um, and then the, the the queen of the south comes later on in the document to, to visit him or whatever. But so it seems like it's a very close parallel here, where it says like you're criticizing me for casting out demons. By Beelzebub. Um, if if I if I do that, their kingdom will be destroyed. Uh, uh, but who are you doing it by? Uh, but if I do it by the power of God, then uh, you know I said that, and then he said, and a greater one than Solomon is here. It's almost like saying Solomon is had power over demons, but I'm a greater one than Solomon. So if that connection is out, that's a pretty powerful thing. I didn't want to read the, the Testament of Solomon passages because it kind of is the theme throughout the entire. Well, you have to read the document. Yeah, you'd have to read the document. Make your own judgment about it, and also jo read what Josephus says. Because jo since Josephus mentions it, and Josephus is pretty ancient, he even says some things that are only found in Dead Sea Scrolls and certain uh, summaries of certain documents of the Bible. Um, I think that shows that the Testament of Solomon is an ancient document, at the very least. Uh, right. With, of course, a later copy which may have language by the scribes from a later period, insertions here and there. Yeah, and then he even goes in and says, like, like he talks about later on how he was, he felt, how he fell by uh, the woman that he wrote the song about. And he ended up sacrificing, like, locusts to another god or something. Like, he, he describes it in the end. It's interesting. Hey, Jackson, we just went through comparing, there's a connection between the Testament of Solomon and the, uh, something in the Gospel of Luke and Matthew. Someone else brought it to my attention, and I was kind of hesitant at first, but then I was like, actually, he has to be right on this, I think. First of all, I was telling them, Josephus actually describes a story almost identical to the Testament of Solomon, which shows that it's an ancient account. Uh, but then, basically, it starts, uh, as I was saying to them, uh, where he's casting out demons, and they're accusing him of casting out demons by Beelzebub. And he's saying, if if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, I, Satan against Satan will bring down the kingdom. Uh, but who are you casting it out by? And then he later on says, the queen of the south came to, to visit uh, Solomon for his wisdom, and one greater than Solomon is here. So in the Testament of Solomon, basically he's using he's using Beelzebub and the demons to like bring in bondage all these demons, like basically destroying their kingdom. And then uh, and the queen of Sheba then later comes in that document to to visit and get wisdom from him. So it seems like it's implying that, like, the whole thing's about demons in, that, in the context of the Gospel of Luke. Um, so when he says someone greater than Solomon is here, it seems like he's connecting Solomon with the demon story. And if that's the case, then it must be connected with his testament. And I did not... Someone else pointed it out to me. Again, someone else did point it out to me. <laughs> Actually, it was, I was just joking. It was me. I found it. <laughs> don't 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 edit don't edit the part out where I tell it to someone else to make it look like I say it's me. Now you're gonna leave that part. Yeah. You you know what? You were you were that guy that was talking to me. Yeah, you you, really? you must have been that guy. I think he saw it on the side. That's right, you're right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go to. Let me see. I think I'm gonna go to Second Ezra. So I'll go through Second Ezra. Yes, it's recording. It's all the same one, so it's gonna be a long one. You will have to save a file and it might be a large file. Uh, so have you any of you read Second Ezra a little bit or not really? Yeah, I have. You have. 
there's something interesting in there, which people don't like it, and I know people, some people have rejected it, the entire book, because <coughs> of this one small part. But to me, I believe it's true, and that is in Chapter 7, which I'll read it. Um, let's see. So, well, as we discussed, you know, about the nature of the Messiah, um, he died already one time. And most people believe he are, he's the first fruit, so he has already had his glorified body, his immortal body. I don't believe that. Even though I believe that he is Yahuwah, I believe he is still a man like us right now. And that I see nothing wrong with the idea of what Ezra is saying that's going to happen. And I believe it will happen. So I'm reading it once I get to there. I'm giving filler. <laughs> right, scars, yeah. Why we have the scars if his body was perfect already? Uh, it doesn't make sense. So it starts saying, let's see, um, how's he walking through walls? Well, how did various people do the miracles? You know, that um, Elijah raised people from the dead, stuff like that. So I think if the Holy Spirit gives power, or if he has power, it, even though he's a man, he might have power, he might have access to certain spiritual sources that he knows how to open that we don't. Um, and he says we can do greater things. Uh, so it says, you want to read the context again. First, read from chapter, uh, the first verse of chapter 7 all the way through. But basically, I'm just going to start with verse 26. It says, For behold, the time will come when the signs which I have foretold to you will come to pass, that the city which now is not seen shall appear, and the land which is now hidden shall be disclosed. And everyone who has been delivered from the evils that I have foretold shall see my wonders. For my son the Messiah shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice for him years. Stop there for a second. Some manuscripts say, when it says my son the Messiah, some say Jesus. Some, you know, they, they word it differently. So you can see how scribes sometimes Christianize or add things that are not in all the manuscripts. Then it says 400 years. Some manuscripts say 400 years. Some don't say any specification of years, and that perhaps is the original reading, no specification at all. Others say 1,000 years, and then some say 30 years. The 30-year reading probably came from people thinking, oh, this is probably talking about the first coming of the Messiah, so they changed it to 30. The 1,000 reading probably came from them saying 400, and they're like, oh, that's a mistake. They changed it to 1,000. It probably was originally, there's no specification of how many years it was, since some manuscripts don't have the numbers at all. But so it says, For my son the Messiah shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice. A certain number of years. And after these years, my son the Messiah shall die, and all who draw human breath. And the world shall be turned back to primeval silence for seven days, as it was at the first beginnings, so that no one shall be left, as in the beginning and the end. The seven days of creation, seven days of uncreation. And after seven days, the world which is not yet awake shall be roused, and that which is corruptible shall perish. Or you could view it as seven days of the new creation of the new heavens and new earth. Um, so and after seven days, the world which is not yet awake shall be roused, and that which is corruptible shall perish. Uh, I'll stop there for a second. So I believe that the Messiah, even though he died the first time, that he's going to die a second time. And most people I've talked to find that view horrible and like blasphemous almost. To me, if he's still a human, then he has to die again. He has to die so he can shed off his corruptible body and put on an incorruptible body. As like Paul says, you know, corruptible must be shed and the incorruptible must be put on. So my understanding is that the, you know how Revelation says after the kingdom, uh, Satan will be released and then he will deceive the nations, and there will be a, a war, and then they will be destroyed. Well, I think when Satan and his people are destroyed, it's actually God destroying them, or Yahuwah destroying them, and he not only destroys everyone of the wicked, but I believe he kills everyone, even the righteous, everyone. He, he, he puts an end to it, so that the new world can, can come. Uh, it is my understanding that death, the reason death exists, is as a test for us. We live our life until we die, and we are intended to die. That was always the intention. Once we die, then we'll be judged based on how we lived our life. It's like a test. And if we pass the test, then we will be rewarded. And we will be able to have many benefits that, you know, people who pass tests get degrees from college. They have so much more they're able to do and more benefits from the world than people who, who fail or drop out of uh, school. They are, they have to suffer in the world much more often. Uh, not always, but you know, it's not a perfect analogy, but that helps with the point. Well, maybe he doesn't, but I think what this says is correct. But I suspect that you could understand Paul to agree. Uh, Paul says some things which sound similar to Second Andrus in other places, like Second Andrus has a view of mankind, like Adam. He talks about Adam in a similar way that you see in Romans, what is it, chapter 5, I think? One of Romans' chapters, which talks about Adam in a similar language to 2nd Ezra, and I think Paul might have been using 2nd Ezra as his 
source for it. I personally think so. Which parts of the? Uh, I don't think so because the document is very pro Torah and uh, like you know it talks about it's very works it's very like saved by works focused rather than saved by faith and so if they were like if they were using Paul and seeing uh, you know they were seeing let's take the gospel of grace and not by works and add it into a document but they're adding it and they're not they're not adding the grace part they're just adding every Adam is horribly corrupt and everyone's doomed except for the few who are going to be saved by their works like it's yeah well we know uh, for in, in many in most copies of second Genesis, the first two chapters and the last two chapters are not part of the text so it's possible that some scholars date the entire document to much later it's possible that only, that some parts were added and not the entire thing. So you want to make sure perhaps some of the document is very ancient and then parts of it were added later. And I, I think it's a very early document um, and I think Paul was appealing to it. Um, it the, the part about Adam, though, is from chapter 3 of, of Second Ezra. And chapter 7 of Second Ezra that we're reading from right now, most of this stuff in almost all Latin manuscripts is missing because... Someone probably, like, basically they found the manuscript where a page was ripped out. And it seems too coincidental that the page that was ripped out had very controversial teachings in it. So it seems like almost someone ripped out a page. And you know how we were talking about how trying to find a source of, if all documents have the same error, they're coming from the same source. Almost all Latin documents have this section missing. And since we found the actual manuscript which has the page out of it, it's almost certain that all these different Latin manuscripts with that page missing, or with that section missing, were copied from that manuscript. Well, it seems like Barnabas might possibly quote from Second Ezra as well. Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, he, he, his epistle of Barnabas says, blood will drip from wood. And you see that exact thing in Second Ezra. So if possible, it's quoting. Not going to taste stuff. Maybe he just means like the eternal life. Then. Oh, how I understand that is it's saying when he comes back, when the Messiah comes back, uh, some are being resurrected. So, some who are alive, they're not going to die. But the, the ones who survive the, the tribulation, they won't die, but they'll be changed so that they can live like a thousand years. Everyone doesn't... Everyone doesn't die at that time. It's, that's, that's how I'm understanding. They don't die when he comes back. Some die. And the, and then at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, everyone dies and then is resurrected seven days later. So here's what it says right here. Like, continuing from the passage. So it says, I, I read how after the seven days, the world which is not yet awake shall be roused, and that which is corruptible shall perish. And the earth shall give up those who are asleep in it, and the dust those who dwell silently in it. And the chambers shall give up the souls which have been committed to them. And the Most High shall be revealed upon the seat of judgment. And compassion shall pass away, and patience shall be withdrawn. But only judgment shall remain, truth shall stand, and faithfulness shall grow strong. And recompense shall follow, and reward shall be manifested. Righteous deeds shall awake, and unrighteous deeds shall not sleep. Then the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it shall be the place of rest. And the furnace of hell, or whatever the word would have been, shall be disclosed, and opposite the paradise of the light. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torment. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment, a day that has no sun or moon or stars or cloud or thunder or lightning or wind or water or air or darkness or evening or morning or summer or spring or heat or winter or frost or cold or hail or rain or dew or noon or night or dawn or shining or brightness or light, but only the splendor of the glory of the Most High, by which all shall shall see what has been determined for them. For it will last for about a week of years. This is my judgment and its prescribed order, and to you alone have I shown these things. The rest of the chapter is very interesting, but I'm not going to read the rest, but I just got this insight today. I didn't know what it was talking about when it said a week of years, but I just realized, I think what it's saying is that the day, of, like, on the day of judgment, people are going to be judged, and there's so many who are going to be judged, it'll take seven, seven years for everyone to receive their judgment. Maybe that's not what it means, but that was a possible interpretation I just got earlier today. It says, the day, the day that has no light and all that other stuff will last a week of years. And it sounds like it's saying seven years of judging all the people who are resurrected, because there's going to be trillions of people being judged. Abraham's with yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the passage is authentic. I think it's prophecy. Um, now I'm gonna read. It's a controversial thing, and you can see why. It even gets more controversial later on. And I think the scribe must have like ripped it out <laughs> or something. I don't know. But uh, so now, <laughs> yeah, good one. I only got that when you just said, you know, you just explained it to her. <laughs> that just is like. It's just like the uh, self-glorification. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so chapter 12, I'm going to only a few verses from there. Verses 31 to 34. And as for the lion, and like essentially he saw a vision. And it says, And as for the lion whom he saw rising up out of the forest and roaring and speaking to the eagle and approving him for his unrighteousness, and as for all his words that you have heard, this is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days, who will arise from the posterity of David and will come and speak to them. He will denounce them for their ungodliness and for their wickedness and will cast up before them their contemptuous dealings. For first he will set them living before his judgment seat, and when he has reproved them, then he will destroy them. But he will deliver in mercy the remnant of my people, those who have been saved throughout my borders, and he will make them joyful until the end comes, the day of judgment of which I spoke to you at the beginning. Um, this is the dream that you saw, and this is its interpretation. Excuse me. Um, then 13, I don't know how much of it I'll read. I have here 25 to 52. But let me see how much I have to read of it. Okay, it says, This is the interpretation of the vision. As for you are seeing a man come up from the heart of the sea in Revelation system. This is he whom the Most High has been keeping for many ages, who will himself deliver his creation. It says his creation. It doesn't say who, like, his could apply to Most High, or someone could interpret it as applying to the man. Who will, who will himself deliver his creation, and he will direct those who are left. And as for your seeing wind and fire and a storm coming out of his mouth, and as for his not holding a spear or weapon of war, yet, yet destroying the onrushing multitude which came to conquer him, this is the interpretation. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, and bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. And they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, and kingdom against kingdom. And when these things come to pass and the signs occur which I showed you before, then my son will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And when all the nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land, and the warfare that they have against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall be conquered. Uh, Brother Schneider, I, I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you, but it's time for some silly platitudes and feckless advice. So we'll be right back after the following interruptions. Okay, so Jackson Snyder present is back. We hope that you got yourself a little bit of snack, like rice check dipped in soy sauce. Yeah. And as for your seeing wind and fire and a storm coming out of his mouth, and as for his not holding a spear or weapon of war, yet, yet destroying the onrushing multitude which came to conquer him, this is the interpretation. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, and bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. And they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, and kingdom against kingdom. And when these things come to pass and the signs occur which I showed you before, then my son will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And when all the nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land, and the warfare that they have against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall be conquered, to me, shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. He shall stand on the top of Mount Zion, and Zion will come and be made manifest to all people, prepared and built, as you saw the mountain carved out without hands. And he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness, and will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts, and the torments with which they are to be tortured and will destroy them without effort by the law. And as for you, for you are seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, these are the ten tribes which were led away from their own land into captivity in the days of King Hosea. I'll skip some of that, but it's very interesting. Uh, then it says, And I, I said, O sovereign Lord, explain this to me. Why did I see the man coming up from the heart of the sea? Kind of similar to Jonah being in the, heart, in the sea. But, uh, he said to me, just as no one can explore or know what is in the depths of the sea, so no one on earth can see my son or those who are with him except in the time of his day. That was 13. And 14, there's only two verses from there. I have just 8 and 9. Lay up in your heart the signs that I have shown you, the dreams that you have seen, and the interpretations that you have heard. For you shall be taken up from among men, and henceforth you shall live with my son and with those who are like you until the times are ended. So it's implying an afterlife and living with his son in the afterlife. Um, so that's all the... The main passages from Second Ezra that I found significant for Messianic understanding of who the Messiah was. Let me see. All I have left here is... I might read a small number of things from Enoch, but uh, tons of stuff from Enoch, and I'm not going to do that. You guys have read through it before, but I think it's worth really studying what Enoch says. I think that's some really key stuff. And maybe we can go over it sometime. Yeah, the Son of Man. Basically, I'm not going to read it, actually, or I'll read, a, I'll read a small part of it, actually. Let me go to Enoch right now and get that out of the way. Just the one part of it is in the dream. A lot of people don't realize what the dream is saying. 
um, the dream of the animals. Oh. Are, are there some parts of it that you were confused about or you're well, not sure I, about? Yeah, yeah, I have. And one question I have is at the very end, um, or towards the, in one translation I have, it says a ram, lamb. I don't know which one. Which is the correct translation? Oh, correct one. If it's a lamb, then I'm like, oh. But if it's a ram, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm okay with that. It's not, that's fine, but that helps me with the job. You hold the lamb. Yes. Um, oh. But if it's a ram, because I see the idea of a ram being king, uh, because of the war. Right. Well, here, uh, so 87, 1 to 4 refers to Enoch being taken and put on a tower. You were familiar with that part? He's he's removed. He, first, he's in the valley with them, watching this stuff in the vision, in the dream, and then he's actually removed and placed on a tower. And he's told, stay here while you watch everything that's going on down. Then it mentions, then it mentions in the dream the creation of the first temple. Then it mentions, it actually mentions Elijah in Enoch's dream. And so I'm going to read that part. It is, we're going through e Enoch's dream vision. Of the animals. Of the animals, yeah. Okay. Most of the stuff of Enoch, I'm not reading this time, but there's so much there. Yes, sir. Yeah. So chapter 89, I'm just reading the context so you guys can see where, where I'm getting this stuff. Uh, okay, so it says, so the first temple was, was what? The first temple was built already, um, as described in the dream. Then in 67, verse 67 of chapter 89, it says, after the, the first temple was destroyed, it, just, it talks about how the, the tower is burnt down. It says, and I became exceedingly sorrow, wait, okay, I, I got a, I, I should have went to what I said. So it's uh, 50 to 56, 50 to 56. Uh, so, so it talks about how the people are really wicked. It says, And again I saw those sheep that they again erred and went many ways and forsook that their house. And the Lord of sheep of the sheep called some from amongst the sheep and sent them to the sheep. But the sheep began to slay them. And one of them was saved and was not slain. And it sped away and cried aloud over the sheep, and they sought to slay it. But the Lord of the sheep saved it from the sheep, and brought it up to me, and caused it to dwell there. And many other sheep he sent to those sheep to testify unto them and lament over them. So, it, to me, by the context of he's going through history, it seems clear to me that he's actually talking about Elijah here. Yes, I agree. This, this uh, sheep is being taken up to him, or ram, or whatever it is. The animal is taken up and placed exactly with him. Now, you go all the way to... Um, 67 to 74, that's the destruction. Uh, it describes how the, the second temple was destroyed right around that area. I mean, the first temple, excuse me, the first temple was destroyed. And then talks about how the second temple was, was built. So we see one place the first temple was built, then the second temple was built. And let me see the one part. Enoch actually makes a, a jab against the, uh, the priesthood uh, in Jerusalem. Basically says... So it says, this is talking about the Ezra and Nehemiah thing, and then so it says, And forthwith I saw how the shepherds pastured for twelve hours, and behold, three of those sheep turned back, and came and entered, and began to build up all that had fallen down of that house. But the wild boars tried to hinder them, but they were not able. And they began again to build as before, and they reared up that tower, and it was named the High Tower. And they began again to build a table before the tower. But all the bread on it was polluted and not pure. And as touching all this, the, the eyes of those sheep were blinded, so that they saw not, and the eyes of their shepherds likewise. And they delivered them in large numbers to their shepherds for destruction, and they trampled the, the, the sheep with their feet and devoured them. Enoch's basically saying right there that the second temple period was a corrupt uh, temple priesthood that was going on. It was not being done properly, and they were blinded in their priesthood. Um, because when they build the second temple, it's not in correspondence with what the law of the temple school commands. So they're falling away from what the law says. They were blinded. Then, then we have 90, 28 to 41, and that's the end of the dream vision. So what it says is, And I stood up to see till they folded up that old house. It seems like it's talking about the second temple. Or maybe it's talking about the dome of the rock or something. But probably the second temple. Carried off all the pillars and all the beams and ornaments of the house. Excuse me. And carried off all the pillars and all the beams and ornaments of the house were at the same time folded up with it. And they carried it off and laid it in a new place in the south of the land. And I saw till the Lord of the sheep brought a new house, greater and loftier than that first, and set it up in the place of the first, which had been folded up. All its pillars were new. And its ornaments were new and larger than those of the first, the old one which he had taken away, and all the sheep were within it. And I saw all the sheep which had been left, and all the beasts on the earth, and all the birds of the heaven, falling down and doing homage to those sheep, and making petition, and obeying them in everything. And now here's the part where a lot of people miss. It says, 
And thereafter, those three who were clothed, the three archangels, in white, they were clothed in white, and had seized me by my hand, who had taken me up before, and the hand of that ram also seizing hold of me, they took me up and set me down in the midst of those sheep before the judgment took place. So he's saying before the judgment takes place, before the tribulation, he's being brought down with Elijah, or the, the sheep, or the ram, in his hand. It seems like he's talking about the two witnesses going down and preaching in the temple, just like Revelation is described. And Enoch says it's before the judgment took place. And then it says, And those sheep were all white, and their wool was abundant and clean. And all that had been destroyed and dispersed, and all the beasts of the field, and all the birds of the heaven assembled in the house, and the Lord of the sheep rejoiced with great joy, because they were all good, and had returned to his house. And I saw till they laid down that sword which had been given to the sheep, and they brought it back into the house. And it was sealed before the presence of the Lord, and all the sheep were invited into that house, but it held them not. And the eyes of them all were opened, and they saw the good, and there was not one among them that did not see. And I saw the house... I saw that that house was large and broad and very full. And I saw that a white bull was born with large horns. And all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air feared him and made petition to him all the time. And I saw that all their generations were transformed, and they all became white bulls. And the first among them became a lamb. And that lamb became a great animal and had great black horns on its head. And the Lord of the sheep rejoiced over it and over all the oxen. And I slept in their midst, and I awoke and saw everything. Uh, this is the white bull that was born, I think, is the Messiah, with the large horns. And then it says it becomes a lamb. So it's a huge bull, which signifies his full strength and power. And then he's lowering his power into the form of a lamb, which is docile, submissive, weak. And that lamb became a great animal, had great black horns. So the white bull had great horns. The lamb had great black horns. And why is it black? It seems to me it's black because it's taken the sins of the people upon its horns. And horns in scripture represents power. Uh, so I think that's what uh, Enoch's prophesying here. A lot of people, it seems a lot of people miss some of these things at the, in the vision at this point at the end. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to read uh, from 2nd Baruch. Have you guys heard of 2nd Baruch? You haven't read it, though? So here's 2nd Baruch. There's only a few things in this that I'm reading from. And when I read it, then I'm going to show you something very similar that Papias mentions. Do you know who Papias is? He would have been an amazing source that we lost. Basically, Papias wrote five books. He lived around the same time as the apostles, but he, he wasn't a contemporary with the apostles. He was a contemporary with the people that knew the apostles. So basically the apostles' disciples. He knew them, had conversations with them, and asked them about what happened. And Papias said he prefers, rather than write written sources, he prefers to talk to the people themselves to hear what they have to say. Because he said the living voice is more convincing for him than books, since the books can easily be tampered, but the person's actual witness is more compelling. Those who actually knew him would know best what the apostles said. That was his... Yeah. So, and he wrote five books. And in his five books, he has some, as Eusebius says, strange and crazy, basically, strange and crazy ideas or whatever. And he says in this papyrus, he's like a simple... Papyrus. Eusebius, the church father, he's like, this guy is like a, a simpleton, a, a weak-minded man, and... But the thing is, it was still preserved, that those books at that time. But now, those five books are completely lost. We only have a few quotations from it, and now it's completely gone. If we had that, that would be a very ancient, very ancient uh, document from the early 2nd century. And it would provide very early testimony for a lot of things. And perhaps it would have uh, showed a lot of things we believe are false. Or maybe it would have confirmed a lot of things that people don't believe. Uh, so that would have been cool if it had been preserved. And who knows, maybe we will find it somewhere eventually. It might still exist in a library somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so... The reason I mention all this papyrus stuff is there's a prophecy from Baruch, second Baruch, which corresponds to something Papias says that Yeshua said. So I'm going to read that part now. It's from it is from uh, chapter 29, it goes from 29 to 1 to 35, 30 verse 5. And he answered and said to me, "Whatever will then befall the whole earth, therefore, whatever will then befall the whole earth." Therefore, all who live will experience. For at that time, I will protect only those who are found in those self-same days in this land. And it shall come to pass, when all is accomplished that was to come to pass in those parts, that the Messiah shall then begin to be revealed, and Behemoth shall be revealed from his place, and Leviathan shall ascend from the sea, those two great monsters which I created on the fifth day of creation. That's also mentioned in Second Ezra as well. Um, and Enoch mentions, uh, a bunch of them mention that. Um, it says, they created on the fifth day of creation, 
and shall have kept until that time. And then they shall be for food for all that are left. So they will actually eat. Um, they will eat the meat, and this is uh, presumably it's clean animal. So much food. Yeah, so much of vegetarian. Yes. yes, and um, let's see. And I saw a thing there that was. Um, well, what was interesting is that, you know, Messianic banquet, and one of the things there is the Leviathan, which is like a fish, which corresponds to the gospel, but uh, I don't know if, I don't think there's any bread mentioned here, so it's not closely paralleled, but I uh, just want to make that connection. But then it says, The earth also shall yield its fruit ten thousand full, and on each vine there shall be a thousand branches, and each branch shall produce a thousand clusters, and each cluster produce a thousand grapes, and each grape produce a cot of wine. And those who have hunger shall rejoice. Moreover, also they shall behold marvels every day. For wind shall go forth from before me to bring every morning the fragrance of aromatic fruits, and at the close of the day, clouds distilling the dew of health. Okay, actually, here's where the bread is, or uh, similitude. It says, And it shall come to pass at that same time, self same time, that the treasury of manna, uh, so I don't know if manna is kind of with bread or not, I can't remember. It says, treasury, yeah, what is it? Treasury of manna. I actually thought you were saying, what is it for a second? <laughs> shall again, yeah, so. shall again descend from on high, and they will eat of it in those years, because these are they who have come to the consummation of time. And it shall come to pass after these things, when the time of the advent of the Messiah is fulfilled, that he shall return in glory. Then all who have fallen asleep in hope of him shall rise again. And it shall come to pass in that, at that time that the treasuries will be open, in which is preserved the number of the souls of the righteous. And they shall come forth, and a multitude of souls shall be seen together in one assemblage of one thought. And the first shall rejoice, and the last shall not be grieved. For they know that the time has come, of which it is said, that it is the consummation of the times. But the souls of the wicked, when they behold all these things, shall then waste away the more. For they shall know that their torment has come, and their perdition has arrived. So that was the passage being quoted. Now I'm going to turn to, um, I'm going to turn to, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, the papyrus, the papyrus, uh, let's see here. No, I don't know, that's the crazy stuff. Um, all right, let me check it. I wrote down the page numbers. Most of these are. Second group, yes, but there's, we only have second group because of one copy, one manuscript copy. If we didn't have that copy, we wouldn't have second group. So that's just like how close so some of these arguments could be completely lost. We may find one complete manuscript, luckily. Um, so I have here 36 to 37. Okay, so yeah, all right. So Irenaeus, you've heard of Church Father Irenaeus. He wrote in the second century five books. So he says... As the elders remember, which saw John, the Lord's disciple, that they heard from him how the Lord taught concerning those times, and said, The days shall come wherein vines shall grow, each having ten thousand branches, and on one branch ten thousand shoots, and on every shoot ten thousand clusters, and every cluster ten thousand grapes, and every grape when it is pressed shall yield five and twenty measures of wine. And when any of the saints taketh hold of one of the clusters, another will cry out, I am a better cluster, take me. Through me, bless thou the Lord. Likewise also, that a grain of wheat shall bring forth ten thousand ears, and every ear shall have ten thousand grains, and every grain five double pounds of white clean flour, and all other fruits and seeds and plants according to the agreement that followeth with them. And all animals using these foods which are got from the earth shall be peaceable and in concord with one with another, subject unto men with all obedience. These things Papias also, a hearer of John and an associate of Polycarp, an ancient man, testifies in writing in the fourth of his books, for he wrote five. And he adds, saying, But these things are credible unto believers. And he says, When Judas the traitor believed not, and asked, How then shall these growths be accomplished by the Lord? The Lord said, They shall see who shall come there too. Now here's a document that was found in, a, it's in a random church father's writing where many, this church father like, there's some church father writings, which all of a sudden they randomly say, we found a book, and we're going to quote the book here now, and we're going to reproduce the book in my document here. And so this is what uh, was said here. And it's, an Apocalypse by James, the Lord's brother, is quoted. Uh, so it says, so first, the say, uh, this this is paraphrased, but the guy, the guy who did this translation, he doesn't always translate everything. Sometimes he paraphrases and says summarizes what happened somewhere. So he says the Savior tells the apostles of the glories of John the Baptist. Uh, he tells a little bit of information about what happened to John the Baptist after he died. Uh, it says he then takes the apostles to paradise, and Thomas asks him how much fruit the trees bear. But now, now it's quoting the actual text. It says the Savior said. I will hide nothing from you about the things concerning which you have questioned me. As regardeth the vine, concerning the fruit of which ye have asked, there are ten thousand bunches of grapes upon it, and each bunch will produce six metrites. 
of wine. As regards the palm trees in paradise, each cluster yieldeth ten thousand dates, and each cluster is as long as a man is high. So likewise it is in the matter of the fig trees. Each shoot produceth ten thousand figs, and if three men were to partake of one fig, each of them would be satisfied. On each ear of the wheat, which is in paradise, there are ten thousand grains, and each grain produceth six measures of flour, and the cedars also are on the same scale. Each tree produces, produceth ten thousand, and is of a very great height. And the apple tree and the Berechion tree, I think that's a Greek word or something, are of the same height. There are ten thousand apples on each shoot, and if three men were to partake of one apple, each of them would be satisfied. So those are like two different witnesses of the same idea that Yeshua is basically saying the same idea of the thousand, uh, basically the abundance, fruitfulness, and mentioning how thousands and by ten thousands it corresponds well with what Second Group mentions. Uh, I thought that's an interesting connection. It's just a lot of the Christians and church fathers later on were very much anti-physical stuff in a literal physical millennial kingdom because if it was a little literal millennial kingdom, the law is going to be in place, and they didn't believe that, so it, it didn't fit with their doctrine. So they had to reject things like the pious and all these documents, and that's why they rejected Enoch too, because Enoch is very fleshly. Their thought, their idea was, well, the angels are going to be very holy, and they're not going to have anything about the flesh, and yet Enoch's talking about how the angels are doing all this fleshly lust stuff doesn't agree with their view of the way angels are supposed to be. So that is a good reason why to understand why they were so anti some of these writings. Um, let me see, 30, 39, oh, that's uh, second group. I have here 39, 1 to 44. Let me quickly check to see if I should read that or not. It just goes into greater detail of the angel's prophecy. Um, and talks about when the Messiah will come. Let's see. And it actually talks about the Antichrist, it seems. It seems to talk about the Antichrist in this as well. So chapters 39 to 40 of 2nd Baruch. Um, I'm just going to skip it, but it's interesting there as well. <clears throat> now, here's what I have left, primarily. I have two quotations from Gad the Seer, and one of them is connected with Revelation in a small way. Two small quotations from Lives of the Prophets. Then I have not too long a quotation from 4th Baruch, and then something from Ascension of Isaiah. And then, small quotation corresponding with some of the stuff we've been reading. And then I'll finish it off with uh, the, the prophecies that I mentioned, or not the prophecies, the quotations about who the Messiah is from the different documents. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our variety show, Jackson Snyder Presents. This is a presentation of the Vero Essene Yahad in Vero Beach, Florida. If you would like more information about today's broadcast, email jackson at hebrewnation.net or visit hebrewnationonline.com. Until we meet again, may Yahweh keep you safe and close to home. the Vero Essene Yahad boot camping in Laid Bag Douglas, Georgia. Will the real Jesus please stand up? And here's Onia Carlson, part four. Book of Gadisir is mentioned in First Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 29. On the authority of Chronicles, it once existed and is a scripture. It was written by Gad and therefore is divinely inspired. And so I'm going to I had, I typed, I actually, I, I bought the book and then I typed it all up in a document. And that's why I have a PDF file of it. There isn't currently available the PDF file online as far as I'm aware, other than my own book. May, but maybe this guy has it, has it in an e-file somewhere. I don't know. But um, I'm going to pull up the GAD. I have it password protected. So I share it with people, but it has a password and I tell people the password. But it just helps so that if someone's sharing it to someone else and they don't, they're not told what the password is, then they can't read it. And the reason I do that is because it's an apocryphal book, and I believe, like the apostles in some of these writings, command that these books shouldn't be necessarily shared with everyone. So those who want to read it, they'll receive it from like a train, a chain transmission of huge password you can read. It. But if someone just finds the PDF randomly on some website, we don't even know who this person is, they won't be able to read it for the password. That's what I try to do for this document. So, uh, yeah, uh, chapter nine. What? I understand better now. How? I understand better now.
in the past you were selective about? I was right. I was so conflicted. Of, I didn't want to hide things from people, but I didn't want to disobey what the scriptures say either. And Peter actually says like he gets conflicted. He got conflicted by that struggle as well. Um, so in chapter nine of Gad, the chapters are numbered by the guy who translated it. His name is Mer Bar Elon. He's an Israelite and he knows Hebrew, modern Hebrew. And he knows ancient Hebrew too, but he speaks modern Hebrew as his main language, but he also knows English. But his actually his English translation, like I went through it, and a couple parts of it seemed like he messed up. Yeah, or proofread, or well, actually, he had to fund. No one wanted to publish it for him, so he had to self-publish it by his own expense because he felt it was so important to release it to people. Because mm-hmm. um, the, the scholarly community have been ignoring this document, they consider it a late document that's not really worth studying. This is Mayor Bar Elah, and he's devoted like 20, 30 years of his life to this document. He's done other, not only this document, but he's spent a lot of time working on this, and he finally published it last year <coughs> through from his translation. So, chapter 9, 19 to 20, verses 19 to 20. It has Hiram, you know Hiram from the Tanakh, Old Testament. And Hiram lifted up his voice and said, this is actually corresponding exactly from what Balaam says, but Hiram lifted up his voice and said, this is Hiram, or Hiram, the, the person with David, who was the ruler of that other nation, I forget the nation's name, but, ally. yes, ally. he was like the ruler of his people, I forget, like, like a king or something. Uh, or something like it's, that. it says, Hiram lifted up his voice and said, I have seen but not now, I have beheld but not now. There shall step forth a son from David, and a moon shall rise out of the house of Judah, and shall smite all the children of him, and shall and break down all the children of Yaakov, and he will possess all the kingdoms of the world. And who is like Yahuwah God above all gods? And who is like Israel, a people above all the nations? May our end be like theirs. And when Yahuwah heard the words of Hiram, it was well pleasing in his sight. It keeps going, very interesting document, but that's the main part I want to read for those verses. The big part of Gad that's really powerful is chapter 1. It's the entirety of chapter 1, and it's pretty much the longest chapter of the document. So I'll try to read through it and not take too long with it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, like a, it's a vision, and so there's a lot of complex imagery, but I think you'll see that it's very powerfully pointing to the Messiah. So it says, In the 31st year of King David in Jerusalem, which is the 38th year of the reign of David, the word of Yahuwah was upon Gad the seer in the month of Zeb, near the stream of Kidron, saying, Thus saith Yahuwah, Go thou, gird up thy loins like a man, and stand in the middle of the stream, and cry in a great voice, Tarry and hasten, tarry and hasten, tarry and hasten, for there is yet a vision for the son of Jesus. And during the cry, thy face should turn to the east, east of the city, and spread forth thy hands toward heaven. And I did according to what I had been commanded. And it came to pass, when I finished calling that cry, I opened my eyes and saw a yoke of oxen, led by a donkey and a camel, coming up from the stream of Kidron, the donkey on the right side of the yoke, and the camel on the left. So oxen, which are clean animals, are being led by oxen. Um, and a great voice was going before them like the roll of thunder, crying in a bitter voice, saying, Seer, 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 these are all the four mixtures that confuse the people of Yahuwah. For the impure and the pure have been mixed. Right, talking about it. Not mixing it. Um, and purity had been put under the hand of impurity, a mixture from seer to rule over them, to increase power over a righteous doer and thus to betray, to destroy holiness, to crown wickedness, to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity. And after the voice came a great shock that shook over the impurity, after the voice came a great shock that shook over the impurity and blew away the donkey and the camel into the moon with a stormy wind. And the moon was opened and looked like a bow, a semicircle, and both her heads reached the ground. So it seems like it's saying like it was opened and it was like this. Um, and lo, the sun came out of heaven in the shape of a man with a crown on his head, carrying over his right shoulder a lamb rejected and despised. And on the crown of his head three shepherds are seen, shackled with twelve shackles. And these shackles were of gold coated with silver. I went through this before with some people and I suggested that the three might be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the twelve, maybe there's twelve sons of Jacob. And these shackles were of gold coated with silver, and the voice of the lamb was heard, great and dreadful like the voice of a lion, roaring over his prey. Woe unto me, woe unto me, woe unto me. My image has been diminished. My refuge has been lost. My lot and destiny has turned me over to my spoilers, and I was defiled until evening by the touch of impurity. And it came to pass, when the voice of the lamb was over, and lo, a man dressed in linen, came with three branches of vine and twelve palms in his hand. And he took the lamb from the hand of the sun, and put the crown on its head, and the vine branches and palms on his heart. And the man dressed in linen cried like a ram's horn, saying, What hast thou here, impurity? And who hast thou here, impurity? That thou hast hewed thee a place in impurity, and in my covenant that I have set with the vine branches and palms. And I heard the lamb shepherd saying, There is a place for the pure, not for the impure with me. For I am a holy God, and I do not want the impure, only the pure. Though both are creations of my hands, 
and my eyes are equally open on both. But there is an advantage to the abundance of purity over the abundance of impurity, just like the advantage of a man over a shadow. For the shadow does not come except by man, and only by the existence of the man is the shadow given to the tired and exhausted. To pure and impure, this matter is even so. For all gates of intelligence are turned around since the death of the eight branches of the vine, as is found in words of righteousness in the true book, but because of the wanderings of the sheep and the, their rest in the visions, intelligence is stopped up until I do greatly in keeping grace. I saw that impurity was driven from the moon and was given to the hand of consuming wrath, ground finally to dust and scattered by the daily wind. And the day burneth as a furnace to transfer impurity and to erase the transgression. And the land was put on the moon forever and ever. The guy who did this translation, he actually changed the, he, he changed the text to make it say sun and he put sun in his translation and re, he he explained the reason why is because later on it seems, later in the chapter, it seems like it's saying that the lamb is now at the sun. And it's, but here it says the lamb is at the moon forever and ever. So he thought that was a contradiction. In his official translation, he actually didn't translate what the Hebrew text of the manuscript said. He corrected it to make it say sun here. And so it says and the lamb was put on the moon forever and ever. And the lamb took of the pure that had been mixed with the impure and brought it as a peace offering and sacrifice on the altar before El Shaddai, jealous Shavua of hosts. And I heard the sound of the song of the Lamb, saying, I shall give thanks unto thee, O Yahuwah, for though thou wast angry with me, thou relented. For Yahuwah is my strength and song, and he has become my redeemer. I will sing unto Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he hath he thrown into the sea of reeds. Rise up, intelligence, rise up, power, rise up, kingship, rise up, majesty and glory. Rise up to help Yahuwah. For God has saved... Well, it might have said Lord. I'm not sure. I had put it Yahuwah, but... It might have been Adam Yee or something like that. Mm. But God has saved one who had strayed and obliterated the impurity from the earth. He fought my fight and brought into the light my righteousness by his help. My help cometh from Shaddai, who made heaven and earth. Verily, who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, but not in impurity? For thou art great over all, raised over all, thou spoken and acted. For thou declared the end from the beginning, and thou sealed everything with thy words, and turned my heart and tormented me. For thy seal is on me, my Lord, and there are three branches of thine and twelve palms that are on my heart. Thou gave me grandeur, thou erased vanity to fear man, and thou gave me a pure heart forever. For that I will praise thee at all times, and thank thee among the nations. For thou hast redeemed me greatly for my king, and did favor to David the anointed, and his seed forever and ever. And I heard a voice crying from heaven, saying, Thou art my son, thou art my first one, thou art my first fruit. Have I not brought thee from the crossing wholeheartedly to be my daily delight? But the, his translation says, Have I not brought thee from Shahor wholeheartedly? I tried to look up the Hebrew of that, and I seemed like it better translate. It like should be translated as the crossing, or the crossing wholeheartedly. But he translated it as from Shahor rather than crossing wholeheartedly. Um, so then, continuing, but thou hast thrown my presence away, and dre so let me clarify. Let me start over in that one where it starts talking. Thou art my son. Thou art my firstborn. Thou art my first fruit. Have I not? brought thee from the crossing wholeheartedly to be my daily delight. But thou hast thrown thy presence away, and dressed up the impure with the pure. And that is why all these things happen to thee. And who is like unto thee among all creatures on earth? For in thy shadow lived all these, and by thy wounds they were healed. For that consider well that which is before thee. And because thou hast fulfilled all this honor to me, because thou hast fulfilled the words of the shepherd all the days thou hast been in the sun, and thou didst not leave them, therefore all this honor shall occur to thee. So, what? Therefore, all this honor shall occur. So basically, it seems like it's rebuking. So, some people might read it and it might sound like it's rebuking the lamb. But I don't see it that way. I see it as the lamb was rejected and despised, and the father rejected the lamb because he was impure. The impure was mixed with the pure. Couldn't look upon him. That's why it says, he, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" The implication is Messiah doesn't know why. He doesn't understand what's going on. He feels forsaken by the father, and so then. So the uh, so the, when it when it says right here that uh, thou art my son, thou art my firstborn, uh, he then he explains to him why he says you have thrown my presence away and dressed up the impure of the pure, and that is why all these things have happened to you. Um, who is like unto you among all creatures on earth? For in thy shadow lived all these; by thy wounds they were healed. And it mentions the shadow earlier. Where it says yeah, the man in the, shadow. the man in the shadow, and it's almost like the, you know how Paul talks about the law has a shadow or something. It's almost like it's saying the law was given for man. Like it, let, let me read what it said. It said, uh, one thing, yeah. Man in <laughs> yeah. It says there is an advantage to the abundance of purity over the abundance of impurity, just like the advantage of a man over a shadow. For the shadow does not come except by man, and only by the existence of the man is the shadow given to the tired and exhausted. To pure and impure, this matters even so. So it seems like it's saying. 
the Messiah gave uh, gave the law, which contains the shadow, shadows, to the tired and exhausted, to pure and impure, uh, to help them. And uh, but the real substance of the law is the Messiah, and the shadow can't exist independent of of the Messiah or of a man. That's why I'm reading it here. But so, anyways, amazing document. I don't see how people, someone could read this and think it's a forgery. It reads like the authentic Book of God. First Chronicles says there was a Book of God. If if there was one, this seems like it would be it. What is it? You mean the doctrine yeah, of? Yeah, but then it puts. It, what is it? What is it? Yo, you're wondering who it belongs. No, no, not my way. <laughs> yeah. Now this document contains the controversial chapter, which that's not the controversial chapter, although it may be controversial, but. The real controversial chapter is, it's in chapter 9 when I read earlier, but I read the part after the controversial part. Basically, it talks about the law of Moses in a way that seems also closer to Christianity in certain ways, but I think Christianity takes it too far. Like, Christianity teaches that the law is abolished. I don't believe it's abolished. But chapter 9 teaches something about the law, which the Hebrew Roots Movement doesn't want to hear, which disagrees with them. But I believe it explains a lot of things that seem to not make sense, like what Paul says. What? Bring it forward as in, like, change the law? Well, it basically... It's more... No, it's more like who the law is for. Who is under the law. Basically, what it says is that... So, you, you know how, like... Okay, so you know how I said earlier that the oral law comes from authentic things, but they lost those things and started corrupting it? So you, you hear, when, you've heard of Noahide law before, right? You automatically associate that with the rabbinic doctrine, and they only teach a small number of things, and uh, they don't have to do almost any of the Torah. Just these little <coughs> things. Because they've, law, they've lost the documents. But Jubilees and Enoch actually seem to teach the same thing, where it seems to teach a law of Noah is given, and that... Like in Enoch, it says a law is given to sinners. And that actually, when you look, that law that's given to sinners is not the law of Moses, it's the law of Noah. And it's the same language is used by Paul when he says, uh, the law was not given to the righteous, but to the sinners, to the this and that, that. But we, we assume he's talking about the law of Moses. But if he's quoting Enoch, Enoch's not talking about the law of Moses. Enoch's talking about Noah's law. And Gad basically says, um, Gad says that the law of Moses in its entirety only is for Israel. There's certain things which of the law of Moses commandments are only for those who are of the nation of Israel. And um, the Gentiles are to keep the commandments of Noah. And then after he's told this, Hiram has told this, he praises the Creator, and then Yahuwah sees how he re how he reacts to him and says, because you have reacted in this way, I will give you the honor of helping to build the, the temple, having the honor of building the temple. So in a way, Hiram actually is helping to keep the law by assisting in the building of the temple. But, the, the, for example, the temple scroll says, it says that, pro, remember the other day I mentioned proselytes and Gentiles can't enter the second courtyard? Well, a lot of the commandments of certain things, like all the sacrifices are supposed to be in the temple area, and they won't, they, they're not able to go in there. Um, and then I, I go through it, I explain, I, I look at different pieces of evidence that I feel like this actually explains so much, and that the law was not abolished, it's that the law actually was always, the law of Moses was in its entirety, like in other words, there's laws in the law of Moses for priests, they don't apply to everyone, laws for this, and there's actually laws in the law of Moses which make a distinction between uh, Gentiles, like it says in, in one place, it says, you are not to charge interest to your fellow Israelite. But you may charge interest to the Gentiles. You were familiar with that? Right. And then a certain you can sell some, certain things to the Gentiles. Although I do believe the clean and unclean animal thing is for Gentiles. I believe the cleanliness laws are also for Gentiles. Um, it, it actually says in the passage when you go in Deuteronomy, it says of clean animals, the the, the you know food that dies of itself or meat that dies of itself. They can sell of the clean animals. They're not supposed to eat it, but they can sell it to the Gentiles. Uh, and then there's, so there's another place where it says, you are not to take an Israelite as your perpetual slave. Right. But you may get your perpetual slaves from the Gentiles. Right, right. There's things like that. So there seems to be a distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. It's not saying that the Gentiles don't have to keep Yahuwah's law. It's saying that there are certain laws which are specifically yeah, for exactly. There's only 12 gates to enter into the courtyards, and the uh, there's no gate for the Gentiles. So Gentiles from another place, they can't enter in. Um, so I think a large portion of it was, and yeah. actually there's a document which... That's why it would be only for Israel. You know, right. There's a document which I was going... 
could have read from, but I couldn't this time. But there's a lot to share of these things. Well, Enoch prophesies that another temple is going to be built. Uh, it doesn't mention that stuff, but it just says uh, basically a third temple is going to be built by in Enoch, and the, the righteous are going to be in it. Yeah, Enoch basically pro prophesies of uh, the temple being built and a resumption of some of the old laws. Um, so anyways, this is a very... Uh, I'll, I'll read the rest of the chapter. There's only a small amount of the chapter. It basically shows Gad's reaction. It says, it says, And I, Gad, son of Ahimelech, of the Jabez family, of the tribe of Judah, son of Israel, was amazed by the scene and could not control my spirit. And the one dressed in linen came down to me and touched me, saying, Write these words and seal with the seal of truth, for Aye, that Aye is my name, and with my name that thou shalt bless all the house of Israel, for they are of a true seed. Thou shalt go for yet a little while, before thou art gathered quietly to thy fathers. And at the end of days, Thou shalt see with thine own eyes all these things, not as a vision, but in fact. For in those days they shall not be called Jacob, but Israel. For in their remnant no iniquity is found, and they, for they belong entirely to Yahuwah. And these words will be unto thee a restorer of life and spirit. And this shall be the token unto thee. When thou enterest the town, thou wilt find my servant David, while he is reading these words from the book of covenant. And yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them. For I am Yahuwah their God. Now shall tell them about the scene. Tell him about the scene that thou hast just seen, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And it came to pass when I came to the house of David, the man of God, I found him as the one dressed in linen has said, and I told him all my visions. Then David spoke unto Yahuwah the words of his song, saying, I love thee, O Yahuwah, my strength. And to me he said, Blessed art thou to Yahuwah, that disclosed his secret to thy ears. And I lifted up my voice, saying, Blessed art thou to Yahuwah, that did not remove his covenant from thee, for he is true, and his word is true, and his seal is true. So that's chapter one. Find the song. Yes. The song. Yeah. Says, mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be powerful authenticity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So the song of the Lamb in Revelation it says song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Yeah. We think that what's in Revelation is the song of the Lamb, but what if it's not? What if it's just quotation of just a, a speech being done, but it's not the song? And the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is what we see in the Book of God. The reason I say that is because it starts saying the song of it says, this is the song of the Lamb soon. Like, let me, let me go to it. Let me read the beginning part. It says, And I heard the sound of a song of the Lamb, saying, I shall give thanks unto thee, O Yahuwah, for thou, for though thou wast angry with me, thou relented. For Yahuwah is my strength and song, and he has become my redeemer. I will sing unto Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. A horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea of reeds. And it keeps going. But it's incorporating the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb as the song of the Lamb. So I'm wondering if Revelation is actually pointing us back to the song of the Lamb of Gath, maybe. I don't know. I found that an interesting uh, connection. So, I'm going to quote from Lines of the Prophets. I told you of this document, uh, I think I told it to you, uh, Ty, of it gives a small account of each of the prophets, of how they were buried, and an especially noteworthy thing about them. Uh, usually it would say something that they prophesied. Ezekiel's one is very interesting, but um, read the Lines of the Prophets through sometime, you'll, you'll like what it says. I'm going to read from the life of Habakkuk first, and then I'll read the Jeremiah one. The Jeremiah one is kind of controversial for you guys, but uh, I'll read it just for consideration. So it says, well, and again, maybe it doesn't mean... <laughs> virgin verse. But so again, you perhaps you could actually interpret it in support of your interpretation, and I'm just reading into it how I'm seeing it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no. Right, and it might be actually able to fit with both perspectives, but let me... I'll read it in a second, and we'll see if it can fit both or not. Uh, so it says... <laughs> yeah. well, this might not be. This might not be a. Uh, this might not be a book of scripture. Oh uh, yeah, rip the page off. This might not be a actual document of scripture. This may be just written by people, but it's a compilation of script or books that they consider scripture. It's quoting from other sources and compiling a a uh, small text of it. There is a place somewhere in this where it seems like it was written by priests because it says something like it says something like this is this is the case. And only few, very few know about this, and only the priests know about this. It's something like that. It's almost like it's implying that it was written by priests. But, yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it was, though, or not. I don't know if the Christians wrote it, or if it was written by a Jew or not. It was treasured by Christians, and they expanded it, reworked it in different forms. And so, this is for Habakkuk. It says, he was from the tribe of Simeon, of the field of Beth Zechariah or the house of Zechariah. Before the captivity, he had a vision of the destruction of Jerusalem, and he grieved exceedingly. When Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem, he fled to Ostracina, and then sojourned in the land of Ishmael. When the Chaldeans returned, and all those who were left in Jerusalem went down to Egypt, he... Wait, sorry, I'll skip all that. Sorry, but it's just giving some of the information, like, it gives the story of Daniel, be I mean, back beating Daniel, that you find in the additions of Daniel. Then it says, 
He gave a sign to the people in Judea that they would see the, in the temple a light shining, and thus they would know the glory of the sanctuary. Is she back or she have to go? Oh. You can write it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Uh, basically, it says, Concerning the end of the temple, he foretold that it would be brought to pass by a western nation. Then he said the veil of the inner sanctuary will be torn to pieces, and the capitals of the two pillars will be taken away. And no one will know where they are, but they will be carried away by angels into the... But they will be carried away by angels into the wilderness where, in the beginning, the tabernacle of witness was pitched. By them, in the end, the presence of the Lord will be made known. For they will give light to those who are pursued by the serpent in darkness as at the beginning. So this seems like a prophecy being quoted from an extra, uh, extra book of Habakkuk. And it will be the same back book that these additions to Daniel is coming from. And it's a prophecy of the temple and the, and the veil being torn. Or the, what did it say? It said, the veil of the inner sanctuary will be torn to pieces. So it's giving some information, uh, which is, if it's authentic, it's a prophecy of the Messiah. Not at that, I don't think it's, did it say that as I read it? Uh, well, oh, right, it said, yeah, it said it, it said, the capitals of the two pillars will be taken. No, no, no. So basically what I just read was, uh, apparently Habakkuk made a prophecy of the veil being torn and the destruction of the temple, which if authentic would be a prophecy of the Messiah. And there's evidence that Habakkuk wrote a book. This is one piece of evidence from this quotation here from the Lives of the Prophets. And also the additions to Daniel. In one manuscript, it actually says this story of Bell and the Dragon comes from an apocrypha of Habakkuk. So I think, and, and that same story as being of Bell and Dragon, or when Habakkuk delivers food to Daniel in the den, that's also mentioned here in the Lives of the Prophets account. So now it's the Jeremiah one, and this is the controversial one I mentioned. It could have been written by a Christian afterwards or altered slightly. I'll read it. So it says. He was of Anathoth, and he died in Tapnes, in Egypt. I'm not convinced he died in Egypt, but it says that he died in Egypt. He stoned to death by the Jews. I agree he was stoned to death. Then it says, He is buried in that place where Pharaoh's palace stood. For the Egyptians held him in honor because of his benefit which they had received through him. They might have transferred his tomb to Egypt. For at his prayer, the serpents which the Egyptians call Iphoth departed from them. And even at the present day, the faithful servants of God pray on that spot. In taking of the dust of the place, they heal the bites of serpents. We have been told by the children of Antigonus and Ptolemy, aged men, that Alexander the Macedonian, when he stood at the, pa at the place where the prophet was buried, and learned of the wonders which he had wrought, carried away his bones to Alexandria, placing them around about with due ceremony, whereupon the whole race of poisonous serpents was driven out of the land. With like purpose he had introduced into Egypt the so-called Argale, in the parentheses it says, that is snake bite. Josephus, I think, mentions them too. Uh, Jeremiah also gave a sign to the priests of Egypt that their idols would be shaken and their gods made with hands would all collapse when there should arrive in Egypt. Yeah, it actually could. It doesn't have to be virgin at all. So I was being stupid. Uh, but it says virgin. So it says, Their gods made with their hands would all collapse when there should arrive in Egypt a virgin bearing a child of divine appearance. Wherefore, even to the present time, they honor a virgin mother and placing a babe in a manger, they bow down to it. Which is strange why I would say that, but you know, if they're given a sign, the Gentiles might easily corrupt it. Um, it says, When Ptolemy the king sought the reason for this, they said to him, It is a mystery handed down from our fathers, a sign delivered to them by a holy prophet, and we are awaiting its fulfillment. This prophet took the destruction of the temple to me. This prophet, before the destruction of the temple, took possession of the Ark of the Law and the things within it, and caused them to be swallowed up in a rocky cliff. And he said to those who were present, Brother Schneider, I, I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you, but it's time for some silly platitudes and feckless advice. So we'll be right back after the following interruptions. Okay, so Jackson Snyder present is back. We hope that you got yourself a little bit of snack, like rice check dipped in soy sauce. Yeah. Congratulations, Bogdan, on your big win at the Gifford Talent Show. Oh, well, you heard about that? Sure did. Well, that, that's a miracle because I win that, I get applause, and I get a big shot of self-esteem. Well, as the big winner, I want to shake your hand. Well, wait a minute, brother. Schneider. Oh, 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 Bogo, Bogo, Bogo. What's the, what's the problem? Brother Schneider, don't you see these great big hands all swelled up with arthritis? You squeezed my hand too hard, it hurt terrible. I think I'm going to just lay down and die. 
Oh, no, wait a minute. You don't have any problem at all. What do you mean? Well, sir, I've got a new jar of Tikkan Olam pain relief cream. Oh, that won't do any good, surely. No, really, really. I just rubbed this into my sore hands myself. And the pain went away. And then when I sprained my ankle last week, I did the same thing. I was really surprised. It's the true testimony. Well, okay. If you think it will help, I will try it. All right, I'll go get it. The next day. Well, there's the big winner. Good morning, Bogdan. And good morning to you, Brother Schneider. I'm a big winner every day now that I have Tikkun Olam Pain Cream. Yes, it worked like a charm. That's because it's got prayer power. Made by hand by a believer like us. So then, wh why do I get more of this pain cream? Oh, you can get that and all kinds of other remedies made of the finest ingredients and by hand at TikOlam.com. That's T-I-K-O-L-A-M.com. Let me buy you a jar, Bogdan. Oh, no, 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 Brother Schneider. Let me go first see if Medicare will pay for it. Well, I don't know whether Medicare will pay for it, but if you want some great products that I use, go to Tikolam.com. That's T-I-K-O-L-A-M.com. Yahad member certified. Oh, yes, we have to have that. The Lord departed from Sinai into heaven, and he will again come with might, and this shall be for you the sign of his appearance, when all the Gentiles worship a piece of wood. Some people look at that and they say, oh, this must be false. But there's two ways to look at it. One is worship could mean honor in a good sense, or it could mean in a bad sense, and it's saying simply that they're going to worship it, but it's not endorsing what they're doing. You know, it could be taken in either sense. Um, because in, we saw that they're bowing down to this virgin in a manger. It's obviously not, not endorsing that. Say it again? Yeah. All right. No, that's the truth. Yeah. Uh, and then it says, and he uh, keeps going. I'll read the rest of it. But it's interesting stuff. Uh, some of it's corresponding with Second Maccabees, which Second Maccabees says in the record, in the ancient records, you find of Jeremiah, and it gives a bunch of extra story that's not in our copies. And there's small fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jeremiah in Egypt. That seems to be the document which some of this stuff is coming from. But it's so fragmentary, we don't have it anymore. The rest of it. What? Yeah. It seems like he went to Egypt and then he went to Babylon. Like he went to different places at the same. Um, so like it says, like I Jeremiah is in the guidance in the scrolls, first person. So we know it's identified as the book of uh, an extra book of Jeremiah. So this document says it's stoned him in Egypt. Fourth Baruch and another document says that he was stoned in Israel. So you've got two different accounts. They're both agreeing that he was stoned. No, when they were, after they returned. It's suggesting that they, they Jeremiah lived to to the return. Go well, for say it again. Oh, uh, maybe seventy years or sixty six years. Or so. Um, so he might have been like ninety or hundred or maybe eighty. I don't know exactly. I don't know. I don't remember when he started prophesying. You'd have to check. So he probably was closer to a hundred, maybe if that was true. Uh, with that. Uh, yeah. Yep. So all that I have left of the missing and prophecy stuff is here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to read through all the Isaiah stuff. There's an extra. Apocrypha of Isaiah. I'm going to read some of it, but there's like a huge thing of it. I'm just going to read the, a couple key parts of it. And I'll, I'll tell you, you can read it on your own or something. But, uh, so 4th Baruch. 4th Baruch. So this is what I have. 4th Baruch, the Ascension of Isaiah, and a couple small quotations from these Apocrypha, which kind of linking to what I've been sharing with you guys. So this is 4th Baruch, chapter 8, verse 1. And this is testifying to the Isaiah book being authentic. It's a witness. Or the Isaiah story being authentic. There's actually and there's two versions of this, the long and the short. I'm quoting from the long version. Seems like that one's more authentic, perhaps. But so okay. And Jeremiah sent to them, saying, "Repent, for the angel of righteousness is coming and will lead you to your exalted place." Now those who were with Jeremiah were, were rejoicing and offering sacrifices on behalf of the people for nine days. But on the tenth, Jeremiah alone offered sacrifice, and he prayed a prayer, saying, "Holy, holy, <coughs> holy, holy!" Oh, skip these two verses. And may Michael, archangel of righteousness, who opens the gates to the righteous, be my guardian until he causes the righteous to enter. I beg you, Almighty Lord of all creation, unbegotten and incomprehensible, in whom all judgment was hidden before these things came into existence. When Jeremiah had said this, and while he was standing in the altar area with Baruch and Abimelech, he became as one whose soul had departed. And Baruch and Abimelech were weeping and crying out in a loud voice, Woe to us, for our father Jeremiah has left us. The hey, Jackson. No, I'm almost done. We're really near the end. Huh? Is that work? I'm in the hospital.
Nice. You are sorry. And we had a back Let's see. I'm moving. So what happens? You're out. You're out. Look, I, I have a clear case. I have a routine. I'm family. I've got a clear on your life. Huh? Your life? <laughs> but uh, the radius is like that. I forgot, I forgot my medicine and I had it sent here. I got here to the post office. Yeah. I leave it as we were stuck to the back and locked it up. Post office. I haven't had it all day. Time. When I got to the hospital, last time I, I went to home, um, I went to the hospital. I could not stay still. The hospital. We can't treat the hospital. Alcohol that you don't have, so I, I didn't have, but they insisted on jabbing a broken cap of my reef, uh, and that was not much I was to do. Uh, uh, and one of the hotters was with me that night, driving off. But they said, Get out of here. I got to go someplace. I can't go someplace. I just hate the big town. He called the hospital. He uh, yeah. had hospital for a week, and I got in there. I couldn't get out. That's not true or about done. I thought a lot of it. I'm sorry. But in the metal hospital, maybe drug addict, you all got to come I got a sign I have not seen it, it just literally, so I called the guy that feels to the guy was an eye rain doctor. I said, oh, it's the rule. Don't think I speak English either. I said, well, this guy speaks no language and his name's Castro. Now, what am I supposed to do? Well, as it turned out, they diagnosed me. I had a sleep that only uh, medication had not be related to my sleep. So, fortunately, that way, they dismissed me with a whole bag of sound for sending that. Of course, I told them, but <clears throat> found that work. It's, it's a nurse. I don't kill bugs. I don't even kill mosquitoes. <laughs> I'm reading from Fort Baruch, and it says, uh, basically, Jeremiah just, it seemed like he almost died. He became as one whose soul had departed. Baruch and Abimelech were weeping and crying out in a loud voice, Woe to us, for our father Jeremiah has left us. The priest of God has departed. And all the people heard their weeping, and they all ran to them and saw Jeremiah lying on the ground as if dead. And they tore their garments and put dust on their heads and wept bitterly. And after this they were prepared to bury him. And behold, there came a voice saying, Do not bury the one who yet lives, for his soul is returning to his body. And when they heard the voice, they did not bury him, but stayed around his tabernacle for three days, saying, When will he arise? And after three days his soul came back into his body, and he raised his voice in the midst of them all, and said, Glorify God with one voice. All of you glorify God and the Son of God who awakens us. Messiah Jesus, they might be added by the scribes, but... Messiah Jesus, the light of all the ages, the inextinguishable lamp, the light of faith. But after these times, there shall be 477 years. It might be somehow connected with the 490 thing. But it says 477 years more, and he comes to earth. And the tree of life planted in the midst of paradise will cause all the unfruitful trees to bear fruit, and will grow and sprout forth. And the trees that had sprouted and became haughty and said, We have supplied our power to the air. He will cause them to wither with the grandeur of their branches, and he will cause them to be judged, that firmly rooted tree. And what is crimson will become white as wool, the snow will be black, and the sweet waters will become salty, and the salty sweet, in the intense light of the joy of God. And he will bless the isles, so that they become fruitful by the word of the mouth of his Messiah. For he shall come, and he will go out, and choose for himself twelve apostles, to proclaim the good, uh, to proclaim the news among the nations. He, he whom I have seen adorned by his Father, and coming into the world on the Mount of Olives, and he shall fill the hungry souls. Uh, one thing to point out is something interesting is the Temple School says that the king is supposed to take to himself 12 Levites and 12 priests and 12 men of Israel to follow him around everywhere. And it almost seems like when Yeshua picked 12 men of Israel to be around him all the time, that he was subtly declaring that he's the king of Israel. That's how I read it. And so I'm wondering if there was a type of prophecy that once existed before Yeshua, which suggested that there would be 12, 12 apostles or 12 disciples of a, of a one who was to come. And Yeshua, familiar with this prophecy, whether it was authentic prophecy or not, you know, like some people might think it's a, a they might not think it's a valid prophecy, but it could have even been still written before. And Yeshua, seeing that and believing it to be prophecy, he could have intentionally chose 12 people 
with the idea of trying to fulfill that prophecy as he understood it to be. So I think the Twelve Apostles concept was came before Yeshua and that Yeshua had that in mind when he picked 12 people. Um, and it says, When Jeremiah was saying this concerning the Son of God, that he is coming into the world, the people became very angry and said, This is a repetition of the words spoken by Isaiah, son of Amos, when he said, I saw God and the Son of God. Come then let us and let us not kill him by the same sort of death with which we killed Isaiah, but let us stone him with stone. And Baruch and Abimelech were greatly grieved because they wanted to hear and follow the mysteries that he had seen. But Jeremiah said to them, Be silent and weep not, for they cannot kill me until I describe before you everything I saw. And he said to them, Bring this part's funny. It's funny, but I'll explain why it's potentially believable if you believe what Yeshua said in the gospel. So it says, And he said to them, Bring a stone here to me. And he set it up, a stone. Just a regular rock. No. <laughs> no. Here to me. <laughs> here to me. Bring it here to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he set it up and said, Light of the ages, make this stone to become like me in appearance, until I have described to Baruch and Abimelech everything I saw. Then the stone, by God's command, took on the appearance of Jeremiah. And they were stoning the stone, supposing that it was Jeremiah. But Jeremiah delivered to Baruch and to Abimelech all the mysteries he had seen, and forthwith he stood in the midst of the people, desiring to complete his ministry. Then the stone cried out, saying, O foolish children of Israel, why do you stone me, supposing that I am Jeremiah? Behold, Jeremiah is standing in your midst. And when they saw him, immediately they rushed upon him with many stones, and his ministry was fulfilled. And when Baruch and Abimelech came, they buried him, and taking the stone, they placed it on his tomb, and inscribed it thus, This is the stone that was the ally of Jeremiah. That's where the document is. <laughs> the ally of Jeremiah. <laughs> That's from 4th Baruch. So, 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 yeah. So, here's the thing where if you believe what the gospel says, it could actually be authentic. So, the gospel says, first of all, well, different scripture says the rocks will cry out, you know, things like that. And then it says, yeah, that's him. Yeah. <laughs> then it says, it says, if if the father wants to, he can raise up sons of Abraham from the from the rocks, from the stones, and that's what we're seeing here. That's being done. And another layer, which is a little controversial, and the uh, you know the whole Kabbalah thing. I don't care about any of that stuff. But I'm wondering if they basically try to do something like they tried to make these golems, and it was this idea of rocks becoming animated into beings that can move around and stuff. This is something that does in Kabbalah. So this could be the precursor of the golem concept that Kabbalah. Does. And also making the statues walk around. Yeah, <laughs> well, I thought it says that I thought it says in the Clement that Simon was also making statues walk around. But yeah, in the Acts of Andrew, yeah. Connection, interconnections through all these different things. So this document said, Isaiah, kill him with the death we killed Isaiah. And the rabbis and ancient documents, uh, I, this apocrypha of Isaiah. The, I'm probably not going to read much from it, uh, but I'm going to basically say what it says in summary. Uh, it describes Isaiah being sawn in half. Um, and in the Hebrews, Hebrews says something about like the people of faith. And one of the things, that it talks about people who were martyrs or died for the faith. And it's a description of people who died for the faith. A lot of them matching up with some of these apocryphal books, like sawn in half, stoned. Uh, different thing like you read through and then it talks about the prophets wandering in the desert with sheep or skins or something um, and it corresponds with certain passages in this Isaiah Apocrypha uh, that was that I was gonna read but there's not a lot of time to read the whole thing so I'm just gonna read only a couple parts of it but so if you want I think um, maybe 15 20 minutes I'll try um, so it's called the ascension of Isaiah scholars usually date it as the martyrdom of Isaiah and the rest of the parts they consider a Christian edition. So this purports to be prophecy of Isaiah's prophecy of uh, Yeshua in great detail. And what's very interesting is, for example, you see in Matthew, as it is written in the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. It doesn't have the quotation in this document, but we don't know where that document comes from. But it's either saying there's a document out there that actually has that quotation, or it's saying it is written in the prophets that he will be called a Nazarene, or he will be called a Nazarene. Maybe it's not a quotation. Maybe it's just saying it is written in, in the gospel in, or in the prophets that he is going to come from Nazareth or something like that. Uh, I don't think it's connected to where it mentions Netzer in the 
in Isaiah or something? I think it's actually some type of prophecy from some book that's talking about him coming from uh, being a Nazarene from Nazareth. And again, it doesn't have this exact quotation, so maybe maybe there was a book that had that exact quotation, which we don't have anymore. Uh, but Isaiah actually prophesies, if this document was authentic prophecy, it purports to prophesy of the Messiah coming, uh, being born, wait, is it born? No. Being raised in Nazareth. And also being born in Bethlehem, I think it mentions Bethlehem. But, uh, Something interesting is that uh, it mentions names, and as I've said, you know, I'm very open to the possibility of interpolations in different places. So it might be harder to believe that people prophesied like Jesus is coming, or something like that. But it is technically possible that he could. Uh, it could be prophetic before, but it's harder. It's, it's just in our nature harder to believe something like that. Um, it's, we, there's reason to be skeptical of. Um, but we. we Jesus, his name is Jesus Christ, which of course Christ is not part of his name. But um, well, yeah, but that's you know that's the translation thing. So but here's what it says. Let me go to it. Uh, it's chapter nine. There's a lot about Messiah earlier in chapter like what was it? Chapter two through four and then five. There's some good stuff there. But I'm gonna read a little bit in chapter nine. And there appears to be a quotation from the New Testament from this document. Uh, church fathers say, like, you know, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, except what has prepared for the hearts, or whatever, however it's worded. Um, church fathers, they differ on which book this is coming from. A couple say that it's coming from uh, Elijah Apocrypha. Others say it's coming from Isaiah Apocrypha. We don't have an Elijah Apocrypha where this quotation is found in, but we do have the Isaiah Apocrypha. And in some manuscripts, that quotation is found, but in other manuscripts, it's not. So that's why the church fathers were saying it's found in this Isaiah Apocrypha, because they were seeing it in some manuscripts. So it is possible that Paul is actually quoting this Ascension of Isaiah thing. Um, so chapter 9 speaks of, it says, oh, hold on a second. Okay. And he took me into the air of the seventh heaven. Well, first of all, there's, it's, it suggests that there's seven heavens. Paul mentions the third heaven. So it's implying more than one heaven, you know. Uh, the other documents speak of multiple heavens. So Isaiah was transformed in his nature to be able to go up to the seventh heaven. And then it says, And he who permitted thee, this is thy Lord God, the Lord Christ, who will be called Jesus in the world, but his name thou canst not hear, till thou hast ascended out of thy body. So this could be something which is, like it says, he will be called Jesus. Again, it's a, potentially it is not, no, they're fifth and sixth Ezra. Ezra. Yeah. That's what they're called. They're, they're fifth and sixth yeah, Ezra. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to read any of the rest of the Isaiah thing, but I'm just going to tell you what it, what it said. Basically, he sees the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. He's told a little bit about their, who they are. He's told to bow down to each of them, and the angels bow down to them. But then, he can't see, he cannot see the Most High in the vision. He's unable to see. The Most High is too above him. But the Son and the Holy Spirit can see him. But all of them, including the Son and the Holy Spirit, they all bow down and worship the Father as their God. So it's showing, in Trinitar traditional Trinitarianism, you don't have the Son and the Holy Spirit bowing down to the Father. You have them bowing down to themselves, and they're all three equal. Like, you know, they're all the same. Basically, uh, and then what we have is afterwards you see that the Messiah, his nature transforms in this document as he descends from the heavens, and um, he he ba basically tells the story of it's very similar to the Proto Evangelium that we've mentioned, and it also is close to the Gospels. And I'd have to read it again to make sure I'm not just assuming again with the virgin birth thing, but it might uh, actually, if it was an authentic prophecy, it might. Uh, Oh yeah, there is a, there is a part that seems very strongly to uh, prophesy of the virgin birth. So I think it's a document that I think at the very least you guys uh, I would advise to look at just to see what it says and then to contemplate on it. And if it was authentic, of course it wouldn't. And if it was prophesying of the virgin birth, it wouldn't agree with the interpretation you have. So you'd have to come to the conclusion of if if it's not agreeing, then you have to either reject it or if, you know you have to figure that out for yourself. I think you find the document interesting. It's called the. Ascension of Isaiah. Okay, yeah. And so that's all the quotations here. They're basically the Ascension of Isaiah is quoted from the Acts of Peter as a proof of the virgin birth. One of one of the prophecies is quoted. Um, so it's a, it's an early document. At least it's confirmed to have existed at least in the second century AD, if not earlier. Anyway, so those are all pretty much the prophecy quotations. So uh, 
Now I want to quote to you guys the, the, the uh, who the Messiah is according to some diverse documents. Only three or four quotations. Is that okay? Are you guys up for that? Yeah. All right. So the first document, I'm going to go in order of, I'm going to go like, I'm going to start with the, the, the Clementine one, which is the one you guys would be most like, yeah, that sounds good. Then the other ones are more controversial. But so I'm suggesting the possibility that what if somehow all three of these are all, are true so maybe it's impossible to reconcile them maybe it's just trying to make it fit i'm just saying you know looking at all possibilities here so okay so it says when simon heard this he said i won't read what simon said and then he says tell me what he said oh uh, right, you want to hear what he said no. <laughs> Um, basically, Simon's trying to say that if the Son of God is from his Father is God, then he should also be God. If, if God gets God, that's Simon's argument. And then uh, Peter basically says, Our Lord neither asserted that there were gods except the Creator of all, nor did he proclaim himself to be God. But he with reason pronounced blessed him who called him the Son of that God who has arranged the universe. And Simon answered, Does it not seem to you then that he who comes from God is God? And Peter said... Tell us how this is possible, for we cannot affirm this because we did not hear it from him. In addition, now here's a little clarifier where he gets a little more specific. He says, in addition to this, it is the peculiarity of the Father to not not to have been begotten, but of the Son to have been begotten. And what is begotten cannot be compared with that which is unbegotten or self-begotten. And Simon said, is it not the same on account of its origin? And Peter said, he who is not the same in all respects as someone cannot have all the same appellations applied to him as that person. And Simon said, this is to assert, not to prove. And Peter said, why do you not see that if one happens to be self-begotten or begotten, they cannot be called the same? Nor can it be asserted of him who has been begotten that he is of the same substance as he who has begotten. Learn this also. Um, keeps going. But anyways, that's the basic point. He's saying he's not God. Uh, now this what? Now this is a quotation from Ignatius of Antioch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ignatius of Antioch. This is from one of his spurious epistles. The scholars don't believe he wrote it, but I believe Ignatius did write this. Uh, these epistles. I no. I basically believe anything that's pseudo is not pseudo unless. I'm absolutely, like, the proof is overwhelming to me. I assume pseudo is not pseudo until proven, it can prove otherwise. So they call this pseudo Ignatius, but it claims to be by Ignatius, and I have I see no reason why not to believe it is. A lot of the times with the pseudo document stuff, the reason they concluded pseudo is because it doesn't agree with their narrative or their idea of what history is. It doesn't fit their time se sense of time period. So it's, Ignatius says, what was it? <laughs> yes. So it says, Ignatius first says that the Son is God the Word. Then he says, um, and he, Ignatius also interprets the, the passage from Colossians as the Son creating. Okay. But then it says, but that he himself is not God over all, and the Father, but his Son, he shows, and then he quotes different passages which showing that the, the Son is not God over all. He is, he, is, he is God the Word, or El the Word, but he's not God over all. You want to hear the passages? Okay, so he says, he says, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. John 20, 17, that is. Uh, and then, when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall he also himself be subject unto him. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. That God may be all in all. Basically, he he himself will be subject to the Father. Uh, and so then Ignatius says, Wherefore it is one who put all things under, and who is all in all, and another to whom they were subdued, who also himself, along with all other things, becomes subject. But then he says, Nor is he a mere man by whom and in whom all things were made. And then, so he quotes different things, trying to show he's not just a regular man. But that he's something more, but that he's not God over us all. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dance. No, that's not all there is. Join us tomorrow night for more Jackson Snyder. Presents. Presents. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>